a song celebrating the king's marriage. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my psalm to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a skillful writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Gracious is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Strap your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on triumphantly for the cause of truth and humility and righteousness. Let your right hand guide you to the awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The people's nations fall under you. Your arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. And your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of right uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have love, righteousness, virtue, morality, justice, and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Above your companions with the oil of jubilation, all your garments are fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. From ivory palaces, string instruments you have made glad, have made you glad. King's daughters are among your noble ladies, and at your right hand stands the queen in the gold of Ophir. Here, O daughter, consider and incline your ear to my instruction. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty, because he is your Lord. Bow down and honor him. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. Glorious is the king's daughter within the palace. Her robe is interwoven with gold. She will be brought to the king in embroidered garments. The virgins, her companions who follow her, will be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing will they be led. They will enter into the king's palace. In place of your fathers will be your sons, and you shall make princes in all the land. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will praise and give you thanks forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I just want to see that I read it out. Thank you, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day, Lord. We bless your holy name, Lord, for you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we honor you today. Lord, we decrease right now. We ask that you increase in a mighty way. Forgive us from all sins, Lord God, anything that we could have ever done, said, or any way that we acted, Lord God, in opposition of the truth, Father God. We thank you for the body of Christ today, Lord God. Cleanse and purge us, Lord God, until we look just like you. No matter what it is, Jesus, no matter what we don't understand, Lord God, you have your way in and through us, Lord God, because we know that we're living in the last days and we need a Savior. There's no doubt in the world that we do not need a Savior. We need a Savior. We need a Deliverer, Father. And Lord God, we know that your ways are right and they're perfect in every way, Father. You don't make any mistakes, not one, do you make? But Lord God, we thank you for showing us, Lord God, truly who we are in you, Lord God. Show us how important we are to you, Lord God, and how much you love us. And Lord God, and why you called us on this earth in such a time as this. Lord God, let us rest, Lord God, our minds and not be jumping around, Lord God. But let us, Lord God, entreat your peace, Father God, so that we can walk in all your ways. We can hear your voice, Lord God. When we get too busy, Lord God, we can't hear you, Lord, because that flesh, that mind, that carnal nature, Lord God, desires to overrule you, Lord God. It's always warring against you, Lord Jesus. But, Lord God, we bring it down into the captivity and obedience of Christ, Lord God, so we can know and understand all your ways. And Father, we thank you for it today, Lord. We bind every principality, this Lord God, in high places. Every devil that's been assigned, Lord God, to every person in here, Lord God, we bind you today in Jesus' name. And Lord God, you drive him out, Lord God, where we don't know he's hiding, Lord God, where we don't know he's lurking, Lord God, drive him out. Drive him out, Lord God, and we surrender our will to you, Lord. 
We give ourselves to you, Lord Jesus, today, Lord, so you can use us. Not this flesh, Lord God, but in accordance to your will. Lord God, let it be done unto us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We are nothing without you, Lord God. We don't want to act like we're something, Lord God. We don't want to walk around here, Lord God, trying to look like anything, Lord God. But we need a nature change, Lord God, to be who you are, Lord God. We don't want to fake, be fake and phony, Lord God, and hypocrites, Lord God. But, Father, we want to walk and do everything you've called us to do, Lord God. Not in accordance to the flesh, but by the will of the Spirit, Lord God. And we thank you for the Holy Ghost today, Lord God. For, Lord God, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it, Jesus? Save the Spirit of God. And we thank you, Lord God, for looking through us today, Lord God, and let your will be done in this place. Every person that has come through that threshold and will come, Father God, Lord, open their hearts bare. Lord God, I pray that you pull up the skirts, Lord God, of the unrighteousness, Lord, in our hearts. We praying that you deliver us from evil. Expose it, Lord God, in every way, Lord God, so we can get it right with you, Father. Tired of playing, Lord God. Tired of playing games, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. But, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, today. You'll show us who we are. Lord God, not what we want to be, not who we think we are, Lord God. But, Father God, who we are before your eyes. That's all what matters, Lord God. And we desire to get that right, whatever it is, Jesus. Because how many days you live, leave us on this land is so we can get it right before you, Father. Because you love us. And your desire is not for us to go to hell because you didn't create it for us. You created it for the devil and his angels. That they'll go and live forever and all unrighteous, ungodly people, Lord God, that love this present evil age, Lord God, that love sin, Lord God, and that walk alongside of folks that do in sin, Lord God, giving occasion to the flesh, Lord God, always desiring, Lord God, that's what's unseemly, Father God. That's who you prepared hell for, Lord. Not for your church and your children. So, Lord God, we draw close to you, Lord God, because, Lord God, we know that some of our ways, Lord God, please you, and some of them don't. And those that don't, Lord God, purge us and cleanse us with the hyssop, whiter than snow, Lord God. Let the blood of Jesus, Lord God, wash us whiter than snow. No matter how bad it feels, no matter what we got to go through, but wash us whiter than snow. So we can come, Lord God, and have a robe of righteousness that's white and pure and clean. That we can be added in, Lord God. Father God, at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord God, we want to be at your table, Lord God. We want to sup with the saints that's gone on before us with a great testimony, Lord God. Had that stayed in the way, stayed in the course, Lord God. Father, that you put before them that they did everything you told them to do, Lord. And those that didn't, they quickly repented to get it right, Lord Jesus. That's all you're telling us, Lord God. You said when we're weak, you are strong, Lord God. We can't depend on ourselves, Lord God, and our minds, Lord. We have to yield everything to you, Lord God, because you're with us, Lord. You're for us, Lord God. You don't want to see us fail, Lord God. You don't want to see us stray away, Lord, because you know what the devil would do to us, Lord God. You understand, Lord God, what his will is for us, Lord, because he accuses us all day long, Lord God, before your face, Lord. So you've made a way out, and that's through the advocate, Lord God, with your son. He is an ever in assessor Lord God in the time of need Lord there's no need for us to always think that we're weak Lord God you've already told us you've given us a way out Lord God a way of escape Lord God from the wiles of the devil Lord God to defeat him Lord God when we tell him no Lord God we get stronger Lord God and you Father God when we mean what we say Lord God we get stronger Lord God as we stand in your will Lord God and listen to your voice Lord God and how to destroy him and how to defeat him Lord God we don't live in accordance to what he tell us Lord God and what his desires are for us Lord but we yield to you Lord God that knows everything you know everything Lord God your ways are perfect Lord God and lacking nothing Lord Jesus and because you love us, Lord God, you love us, Lord God, and we know it. You gave your only begotten son, your only son, Lord God, so we can live, Lord God. You did that for us, Lord God. You did it for me, Lord God. Oh, God, we thank you, Jesus, for your son, Jesus, today, Lord. We lift him up before you, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord God, for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to the Father. 
We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for just knowing, Lord God, our names, Lord God, when you stood and when you went obediently to the cross of death, Lord God, to the cross of the crushing of the skull, Lord God, so that flesh, Lord God, can be destroyed. Lord, you made the way, Lord God. All you're telling us, look, give up your ways and just be obedient. Listen to what I'm telling you. Read my word and do what I've told you in my word. You hear down in your conscience, your inner man, what you're to do every day. You hear it. You hear it. It's not far away from you. It's only far when you want to be disobedient. You want to push the voice back. Listen to my word. Listen to my word. Listen to my word. Listen to my word. Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For not failing us in any way, Jesus. Your word is so true and it's so right, Lord. And you've given us, Lord God, the victory over every devil in hell. You've given us the victory. You've shown us, Lord God, how to wage war with him and to be victorious. And Lord, today, Father, we open up our hearts to you. And we invite you to come in, Lord Jesus. Change us, Lord God, again today as we surrender our wills to you. And as we offer up the sacrifice of praise, Lord God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We put our lives on the altar, Lord God. Our homes, Lord God, our children, Lord God, our loved ones. We put them on the altar today, Lord God. Burn them up, Lord God, for your glory and your honor. So that you will be blessed, Lord God. We give us, give you our lives, Lord God. Burn us up as your sacrifice, Lord God. And release us on this perverted world, Lord God. That your light will shine, Lord God, from glory to glory and from faith to faith in and through us, Lord. Release us on this devil, Lord God. And give us the strength to stand and not ever back up from him. In the name of Jesus. Because of the blood, the power of your son's blood. is pure and it's clean, Lord God. And you pour it in us, Lord God. To wash through us, Lord God. And to purge us from every iniquity, Lord God. That could ever be found in a human body, Lord Jesus. The power of the blood, Lord God. To give us a mind, Lord God. To be stayed on you, Jesus. And never, Lord God, to vacillate, Lord God, between good and evil, but to keep our minds on good, Father God, in your ways and your will, Lord Jesus. Never yield into the flesh, because that's the power in the blood. When we listen to you, Lord Jesus, have your way today. Have your way in us and through us, Jesus. Have your way today, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you everything today. When there's one member in the body, Lord God, that's hurting, the whole body hurts, Lord. Because that's who you are, Lord God. Your love and your mercy and your compassion, Lord Jesus. If I stump my toe, Lord God, my whole body hurts, Lord God. And you've designed it to be so, Lord God. To give us a heart, a pure heart and, and warmth, Lord God. To be able to know and understand how you feel, Lord God. When we stray away from you in our minds and our hearts and we do things that you're not pleased with, you let the body understand how you feel, Lord Jesus. Because you have fellowship, Lord God, with our infirmities, Lord. And you're making a way out of no way, Lord God, for us to be victorious. The way is straight, Lord God. The path is clear, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the word today, Lord God. The son of the living God. We thank you, Jesus, today. And Lord God, we glorify you. And we're going to lift up your holy name. Because of who you are, Lord Jesus. Because of your goodness and your mercy, Lord. And we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. 
We love you, Lord. 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 And we thank you today, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us a way out, Lord God. Oh, my Lord, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. And we yield to you right now, Lord God. And we desire to be everything that you want us to be. Everything, Father, Lord God, just give us a heart to see it your way, Lord, and a mind to know it, Lord God. We want to be everything you want us to be, Lord. We want you to be pleased with us, Lord. At all times, Lord God, because of who you are, Lord. We're not asking for your hand this morning, Lord God, but we just thank you for your love today, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Jesus, because we love you, Lord. And Father, we give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and we pray and let the redeemed of the Lord say, amen. Give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We belong to you, Jesus. We belong to you, Lord Jesus. We belong to you, Jesus. We belong to you, Jesus. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The unmatchless name of Jesus. Wonderful Savior, Jesus. Bright and morning slam. Lamb of God, who was slain for us, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We magnify your name, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. There's power in your name, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us a sound man, Lord. Jesus. Every time we call on you, Lord, you're always there, Lord. You're always there, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory Salvation, 
washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Jesus, he's so good. He's so good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord God. We glory in your presence, Lord Jesus. There's none like you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for dying on the cross for us, Jesus. And not turning away, Lord God. Father God, we thank you. For your son that you gave freely. And because you have, Lord God, we give ourselves freely. In exchange, Lord God, for a life in you, Father. Because we need you. Without you, we won't be able to make it through here, Lord God. We thank you for everything, Lord God, that you've ever done for us. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you will do for us from this day forward. We thank you, Lord, and we appreciate you, Lord. And, Father God, when in times we've hurt you, Lord, we are sorry, Lord Jesus. And we ask that you forgive us, Lord God. We are sorry, Lord God, because it's you that we sin against, Lord God. And there's no need for it because you've already given us a way out of temptation, Lord God. And, Lord God, we ask you to forgive us today, Jesus. 
Forgive us, Lord, and have mercy on our souls, Lord God. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy, Jesus. Have mercy, Lord. And Lord, we dedicate this day to you, Lord God, in this time. We thank you, Lord God, for Judah has truly plowed the field this morning. Lord God, we thank you for the seed that will be sown in our hearts, Lord, where we'll be transformed more and more into your image, Jesus. And Father, we thank you for it, Lord God. We pray for the saints, Lord God, that are standing this morning that will be killed, Lord God, because of the name of Jesus. We thank you to stand with them, Lord God, send an armada of angels, Lord God, to encourage them, Lord God, where they know that they can make it, Lord God. This life is only a temporal life anyway. Anyway it is, Lord God. It's only temporary, Lord Jesus, in a light Moment of affliction, Lord God, in the twinkling of an eye, Lord God, we'll be with you. We'll be with you. And, Father, we thank you, Lord God. They can't kill us, Lord God. All they can do is talk big talk. But, Lord, the day this breath leaves this body, Lord God, we're in, the, in your presence, Lord God. We're in your presence, Lord God. We're in your presence, Father. And we thank you for it, Lord God. No fear, Lord God. No fear. No fear in the name of Jesus. But, Lord God, we thank you today, Lord God, for the power in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus over every person in here this morning. From the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Lord God, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus poured out this morning. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Pour it out, Father. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to never lose his power. The blood of Jesus, 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 the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The blood of Jesus. Just drown us in the blood, Lord God. Drown us, Jesus. In your blood, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, just drown us in it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Make us whole again, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus over all sickness and disease, Lord. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank All right, how's everybody Jesus. doing today? We're going to get rolling here. Another Sunday. What's today? April 4th. Rolling along. Man. We out the first quarter on us. Time. Time is out of control. You might as well just take your hand off the wheel because time is rolling fast. So you just got to go with the flow now. All right, before we get going, got a few announcements to make. The usual ones. Always telling you about these books to help you. The first one is Derek Prince, Pulling Down Strongholds. Strongholds hold on to your life strong. They're strongholds. They're not just going to go away. Jesus said some demonic powers only go forth by prayer and fasting. Some stuff is strong and it's embedded. It can be so immersed in your personality that it lives in you as you. You'll never see it because you actually live in it. You wallow in it. You think it. You breathe it. It's become one with you to the extent that your personality is absorbed into the thing and you can't see it. So you got to have a separation of soul and spirit through fasting and prayer to be able to see the enemy. See, that devil hides down in the murkiness of your own soul, invisible. It's a stronghold. He never puts forth the thing that is evident as you. In other words, character traits that you know are not right. You can see those. You can see the stuff that you know is abnormal. Thoughts that are abnormal, stuff you shouldn't be thinking, stuff you shouldn't be saying, stuff you shouldn't be doing. That's the evident stuff. But buddy, the thing that he hides deep in the inner recesses of your soul is a stronghold. 
Fasting and prayer must be wrought in order to peel back the layers of your soul to see what's in you to attack it and eliminate it. Jesus said, these kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. You know, you can be circling in your life for 50 years, bound by a stronghold, unable to figure out what's going on, but it's a stronghold. A stronghold, one of the characteristics of it is this, it won't let you go. You won't progress. You won't fulfill anything. Your destiny will be thwarted. It'll always be trying to go ahead, but you take two steps forward and three steps back. It's like a curse on you, but it's really a stronghold that does not want you to progress in God. It wants to limit your future by attacking your present, and it uses your past to exploit you. So it uses your past, binds you to the present to forbid your future. A stronghold. Pulling down strongholds, Derek Prince, get a copy. <laughs> you know, all I can do is tell folk, you know. My job is to tell people what they do about it. I can't control that. Amazon.com, I got a copy of it, you can too. Derek Prince, Pulling Down Strongholds. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a little small book. You can read it, you can ingest it, digest it, it can, and you can respond to it, and it can change you. Why not? Who wants to stay like you are? Whatever state you're in, you don't want to stay like you are. I don't care what you think you are. You don't want to stay like you are. Life is progressive because God is progressive. You want to move forward, but strongholds won't let you. Get a copy of this. Derrick Prince, Pulling Down Strongholds. These can go up not out, but by prayer and fasting. It takes a war to be free. The devil doesn't let, let anybody go. You got to fight that fool. You got to fight out because he's not prone to let anybody go. He's, he gives no free passes. You've got to engage him, and you've got to overcome him in order to walk away from him free. Pull it down, strongholds. Derek Prince, Amazon.com. The other one is, of course, the organic gospel. This book teaches you that, hey, the gospel is indeed organic. It's alive. If the Holy Ghost anoints the Bible, it plants in you as a seed. Jesus says the sower sows the word. It's organic in its content. So therefore, it reproduces Christ in you, which is the hope of glory, according to Galatians chapter 4, I believe it is, saying, look, I'm, I'm laboring with you in birth pains, the apostle says, until Christ be formed in you. So the formation of Christ comes about by growth stages. It's like a baby that's conceived in a woman's womb. The baby is not conceived full grown, and the baby is not uh, conceived in nine months. You got to go through gestation. So you receive Jesus, that's conception. Now you've got to go through gestational periods of growth until he's formed up in you and made mature in you. And every time you go through a growth phase, it's going to be something you've got to leave behind. You'll find you walk with certain people, but you outgrew them, you leave them behind. You hang on to that group when God is delivering you from that phase and moving you forward, you're going to bind yourself to that group and it's going to limit your progression. You know, you thought that you were going to marry this dude, but you outgrew him. And God told you, you need to go here and don't let that go. That boy ain't even full grown. He's still a boy in his mind. And you outgrew him and you're tired of these conversations, tired of this stupid stuff he's doing, tired of this stupid stuff he's telling you, tired of him getting drunk and hanging out all night. You outgrew that. See, if you're a real woman that's developing, you outgrew, outgrew certain guys. They stayed where they were. They got a backwards cap on, listening to hip hop and Lil Wayne. And you became somebody that's more mature. You outgrew that phase in your life and there's no compatibility with that person anymore. And God will tell you, it's time for you to become full grown and move on. You hang on to that. You marry that. Now you got 40 years of agony. Sleeping with the enemy every night. The organic gospel, man. It'll get you out of that. I'm trying to make you avoid the worst mistake of your life, the organic gospel, man. www.theorganicgospel.net. www.theorganicgospel.net. A new class starts tonight, 6 o'clock p. Is it 6 o'clock? Straight up, 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Norman will start a new class tonight. If you go to www.theorganicgospel.net and click on the link, it will navigate you over to the place where you can join that class. 
Also on this same page, www.theorganicgospel.net, you can click on the link to download the study guide. We got everything in place for, to, to help you if you want to be helped. We can help you if you don't want to be helped. I don't care what surgeon you're in front of, if you don't lay down on that table and let them put you under to operate on you, that surgeon can't help you. You got to submit to what? The surgery. If you don't submit to the process, there is no way to help you. So we put tools in place to help you, but you must submit to the process. www.theorganicgospel.net. Join the class starting tonight. These classes run, what, six weeks now, man? Eight week classes, eight weeks for so the next two months. You're going to be in there every Sunday at six o'clock and he, they're going to go through the whole organic gospel book. Not only giving you just the, the information in the book, but adding revelatory information to enhance it. So the book comes alive for you. So you understand this. And plus they have a lot of discussions with people, different inputs, different takes on the book, what they got from it. It's a good discussion going on every week to enhance your studying of the book. 128 pages, but hey, in 128 pages, we believe it's a lot of life-changing information here. If you understand for the first time in your life, life a lot of times that the gospel indeed is organic. This is a missing message in the church. They don't teach this in the church because most preachers don't know it. They yell at you and stomp around and spit in the microphone all day. But this thing has to become more cerebral and more academic for you to get understanding. The Bible says... In all you're getting, get what? Understanding. understanding. Knowledge is the principal thing, but with all of your getting of knowledge, get understanding of the knowledge. You got to have some kind of an academic acumen appended to the Bible for you to grow in it. What good is it to preach at your stuff out of the Bible and it doesn't matter and it doesn't change you and it's not appended to your life in a practical way so you can walk in it? That's the goal, to really change you to be able to adapt to God's kingdom and be fruitful in it. The organic gospel seeks for fruitfulness. Anything organic that's planted that is going to produce a fruit has to go through gestational periods until you see fruit on the vine. The goal in the gospel is the nine spiritual fruit found in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. And the Bible says against those nine fruit... There is no law. God's after a nature. Once he changes your nature, he doesn't have to give you a law to obey because you obey God by nature. This is the missing element in church that folk don't understand that it's a nature that he's after so he doesn't have to strive with you. You want to do what he says because you're like him. We're going to talk about that a little bit today about the likeness of God. God doesn't have to strive with himself if he makes you over to be like him. You'll adapt to him and obey him by nature. The organic gospel will teach you this. Join this teaching session. If you haven't been through it, if you've been through it before, go through it again. Hey, look, the organic gospel, whatever you need for you to develop you, do it. 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Log on to that website, theorganicgospel.net. It'll take you through the joining of the website, uh, the Zoom meeting for you to uh, engage in the, in the class. And also the study guide is there for you to pull down to help you as you engage in the class. Next thing, remember the prayer line every night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every night, the prayer line. Join the prayer line. It's, in, it's designed to ha help you pray with others to move you forward again. Everything's designed to move you forward, not to stall you out, not to see you remain stagnant. We want to see you progress in God. Join the prayer line, 712 770-5603. 712-770-5603. And the access code is 409-367. 409-367 is the access code. Join the prayer line every night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except for Wednesday, when it's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, following Bible study. Join the prayer line. Again, it's designed to help you grow in grace. Next, remember Deuteronomy's Tabernacle. The goal is a base camp for the people who are going to conduct this end time war. It's all about a warfare with the devil now. It's not about church and jumping around and shouting and running and blowing bubbles. We've got to engage an enemy that's come on shore heavy to destroy everything in sight. It's destroying your kids, destroying families, destroying relationships. 
you've got to stand up now as a man or woman of God to confront the enemy at the gate. God gives us weapons of warfare, he says in, in, uh, in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He, clad, he clads us with armor. We're armor clad, according to Ephesians chapter 6. Then he says, no soldier that engages in this warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that it may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So these things are about those that are going to go forth to confront the enemy that has come in like a flood and God is raising the standard up against that enemy. Dunamis Tabernacle, a base camp, not another church. The last thing we need, need is another stupid church. We need a base camp for militarized Christians who are going to engage an enemy to operate from. We've changed going to church to going out from church. We bring you in. We equip you. We metamorphosize you into a soldier. We give you your armaments, and then you go into the battle. It's not about you following anybody. Don't follow me. I don't need nobody following me. I don't need any kind of verification or some kind of a validation for me. You better get it for you because you got to stand before the Lord for yourself. He's going to hold you accountable for what you did in your mortal body. So my thing is, we'll provide the tools, the weapons, the armaments, but you got to use them. You got to put the armor on. He says, take unto yourself the whole armor of God. You got to do all this. It's up to you and what you do with the tools. So it's all about no longer that make-believe church world where you go and sit in theater-style seating, listen to something you call a sermon being put forth by something you call a preacher. That's make-believe. That's never the design of church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to perfect the saints so that the saints can go and do the work of the ministry. So what are you going to watch a minister for when you're supposed to be the minister? It takes sometimes years to wash that out of people's minds. They'll sit dormant with their mouth hanging open, listening forever, never realizing I am the answer. I'm coming to try to find an answer or listen to an answer when I am the answer. You got to become the weapon. You got to become the tool. You got to become the one that's doing this. You can't follow anybody in this. Organic transformation means I become the tool in the master's hand to bring the devil's kingdom down. Me, personally. It's individual. I say it all the time. It's an individual affair that cannot be faked. And now we're seeing God beginning to separate. He's going through and walking through the body, picking out soldiers that mean business. All by himself now. God does this thing by himself and he's doing it now. So look, Dunamis Tabernacle is not your grandmama's church. We're not, we're not soliciting and we're not trying to get people to join anything. We don't need recruits to come in here thinking they're joining another church and shaking a preacher's hand. We need combat ready, hardened people to say, you know what? I know what I joined. I know the intent, the content, and what God is looking for. And I'm ready to be forged into a vessel fit for the master to use. I want to be on the front line. And if I perish like Esther, I just perish. But I'm wading into this thing for me this time. We're here for those people. That's all. If you're just a nominal churchgoer, there's several churches around, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Episcopalian churches, Word of Faith churches, all the gymnastics of make-believe church life. But if you intend to be the church yourself, because the church is not a building, the church are the living people that make up the body of Christ, then Dunamis Tabernacle is there to see you developed into what you need to be. Support it worldwide. We're looking for a million people. You see, it's a time appointed for this. God knows that we're going to really do this, so he holds us back as an act of mercy for the world. You got to understand that he don't let you go because he knows what you'll do. You're a finisher. You'll really do it. You'll really go see Goliath, for real. See, all the rest of the boys in the army were watching Goliath yelling. But when David showed up, he went out to greet him. So God holds back David to a time appointed. See, God knows from time spent with him and prayer to him, Anyway, you know, I'll experience suicide by gospel. <laughs> now, some people go and have suicide by police. They try to confront the police for the police to kill them. They do that on purpose. 
They go out there waving a gun at the police, and the police just gun them down because they committed suicide by police. They didn't have the nerve to shoot themselves, so therefore they let the police do it by threatening the police until they shot them. So the thing is, when you're in the gospel, you have no conscious awareness of living here or your life here. So you just tell anybody that anything you're big enough to tell them because you don't care about the response. See, that's when you're real. The fake people try to hedge their bets to make sure nothing happens to me. Go home. Go back home. Go on back home because you're not for real. Trying to make sure I don't pay a price. I wasn't the one that said it. I'm not accountable. Well, I wasn't really there, and I was in the background holding a sign, but I wasn't up front. Go home. Go home because you're a coward and you're a hypocrite. We're looking for frontline folk that are the ones that said it. I did it. I'm the one that meant it. Like they said that I said it, I meant it, and I'm here to represent it, that old cheer in high school. <laughs> That's what we're here, about, here for. So if you're not cut out of that cloth, this is just not for you. No harm, no foul. Doing the best tabernacle is for those kind of folk that are in there, amalgamated into the, into the gospel with other people of a light, precious faith who are going to do it with or without you. They don't look horizontally. They don't look back, forward. They don't look side to side, right or left. I'm here to do this myself. I don't know who else is doing it. I don't care. I'm not aware of you. I don't care nothing about what you're doing. I got my tools. I got my armor. I got my weapons. And I'm getting ready to do this myself. I'm sick of this big mouth Goliath yelling at us, us. And I'm going out to confront him for me. Tag alongs don't make it. You're a tag along. Remember that boy who ran away naked when Jesus got crucified? He was a tag along. And the soldiers grabbed him. Ripped all of his robes off. He ran around. around. All you saw was a, a naked butt running over the hill. He was a hypocrite hanging around Jesus. But when the point of crucifixion came, he, he bolted out the door and ran like a madman. You know, he won't even make sense in the gospel. Why is that even in there? He's trying to show you what you will be. When you hang around the church, but you're not for real. When the point of conflict occurs, you will turn tail and run. Because you hadn't been forced into what's necessary to be in the battle. You see, you can't fake this, man. A lot of folk hip around, hypocrite around the gospel. I've seen a lot of folks, man, in 37 years of doing this. That thought they were going to get in it. But, buddy, when that thing got hot, it might have been you and maybe your dog standing there. Because your dog was faithful to you, you know. But other than that, you stand alone a lot of times because most church folks are just hypocrites. As a matter of fact... The real gospel frightens most folk. Did you know that? They're used to a church service and like an Easter service or something like that. They didn't expect it to be real because the gospel is just make-believe in the, in the streets. It's make but it's not real. You come there, everybody's a sinner, everybody does what they always do, and you just go through a service. You went to Piccadilly to eat. You went shopping for an Easter suit and an Easter dress yesterday because you had been to church in like 10 years. So you went and bought yourself an Easter dress, some new shoes, and got your hair done. Maybe your nails, if you had a little extra money. You slide into church on Easter and Christmas, and you go through the gymnastics of church entity, but you never thought it was real. You mean somebody really believes this? Demons are real? The devil actually can come see you? You know, it's real? You mean this is all real? Yes, it's real. I was talking to a guy one time talking about he didn't believe in demons. I said, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I'm going to cast out some demons next week. Just come with me. And once you see them levitate off the ground, once you see them talking to you, vomiting on you, cursing you like a dog, putting their hand through sheetrock walls, you'll believe after that, bro. Oh, no, man, I, I, ain't, I ain't for all that. I said, listen, you don't believe, if it's not real, what do you have to worry about? Talk is cheap. You come with me to cast out this demon. See, that's when they step back because they're not for real anyway. They just want to talk and argue and debate. No, man, you get on the front line, then you talk to me. Outside of that, shut your mouth because you're a coward and you got no guts. Don't step up into this as a coward and a hypocrite trying to debate what you call scripture. Go somewhere.
It's time for some real people. One of those people, only one of those people, not these other folk, folk that mean business, support the vision. Support it at www.omegaministries.org. www.omegaministries.org. Click on support, then donate, and do the best you can. We don't talk about a tithe because there is no tithe in the New Testament. You won't find anybody discussing a tithe in the New Testament from Acts to Revelation. It's not there. Why? Because he covered it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He says, don't give grudgingly or of necessity. Don't make it necessary. But you give as the spirit leads you. Whatever he puts on your heart, that's what you do. Anybody trying to make you give 10 percent is a liar. Now, if the spirit inspires you to give 10 percent all the time. That's between you and God. And it's just a 10 percent obedient giving to what God said to do. Don't call the tithe. He told you to give 10 percent. That's what you do. But don't try to make another person do it because he told it to you. See, that's where you go off the rails. If he told you to give 10 percent, you do that. But if you try to make it a doctrine for somebody else to do, now you're going outside of the spectrum of obeying God because he didn't tell them that. He told them 30 percent. You see how silly it is? He told you 10 percent making $35,000 a year. This person makes $800,000 a year. He told them 30 percent. See, don't control it. It's God that works on us to do, do what? To will and to do of his good pleasure. As men as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The whole church is governed by the Holy Ghost individually talking to individuals about his will for them. You got to know that or else you're going to bind people under the law, making them obey stuff that's not even in the Bible. So you got to trust God to walk in this because God talks to people. God inspires people to do what he says. And you just trust him to do what he does. I know if God does flood money in here to do this, he's not ready to go. But when he's ready to go, the resources will be right there to go. And it's going to be terrifying because we leave scorched earth behind us. We're not trying to fool around with this a long time. See, I'm not here to fool around with people and talk all day. We go from what? Enticing words of man's wisdom to demonstrated power. That's when you know you're going because when he switches to demonstrated power, he does, he's not playing with anybody. Ananias and Sapphira are dead in front of demonstrated power. See, he's not going to be playing with folk, so he delays to have mercy, grace, give people time. God almost pleads with people for years. Study the Bible. He'll plead with Israel for years. Then one day, he comes to see you. Sodom and Gomorrah, long time. Long suffering is one of the attributes of God. Then he comes to see you. Noah building an ark. You know how long it took to build a ship that big? He had to be pleading with those people all the while that boy building that ark. Then one day, he sealed it and it started raining. And everybody drowned. See, we don't, we don't, we think we want a, a day of visitation from God. He says that the day of the Lord is a gloomy day, a dark day. It's a terrifying day. You think you want the Lord to come down here and see about things and take care of business? A lot of people die when God shows up. You don't want God to judge and, and be, be somebody that comes with a, a final decree. And you, might, you might blow smoke about God, your presence, your anointing, and all that stuff. It sounds real good in theory. But you watch him do something. I've been in this for 37 years. I've seen a lot of people die in this playing with God. I saw a guy in front of church struck by lightning and killed, playing in church, trying to be a fornicator. Killed him out in front of the church, standing at the bus stop. <laughs> it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of an angry God. When, he, when he's through with you and he comes to see you, that can be a terrifying event. So I'm just telling you, don't play with God because it's serious. It's very serious. If you're for real, join the army. We mean business. When he goes, we go. No looking back. It's like driving a metro down the street. No looking back, no turning back. We're moving forward. We're loading the ark for departure. God is almost through with this world. The parameters being set up down here are the last parameters before the mark of the beast and the Antichrist comes to power. 
He's making the devil play according to his rules. God is using the devil to set up the scenario for the church to evacuate. Everything is already pre-planned. You know, the Bible says Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world. You're dealing with a timeless being who's not subject to time. So what is past, present, and future to us just exists to God. He sees the panoramic view of all of time from his, per his perspective. He's looking at time outside of himself. So he can see the past, present, and future in one snapshot. So he already knows the future because he's already seen it. So my thing is let me draw myself to his mind so I see life from his perspective and not a human perspective. That way nothing will shock you. We had a message one time we preached called shock proof. Nothing bothers you. Nothing's unbelievable. Nothing is unscheduled because I'm not subject to time and space like a normal human being is bound to time and space. You've got to get your mind out of here to see life from God's perspective and not yours. Because you'll be overwhelmed by this world if you just see it from your point of view. you got to see it differently. This is going to be a rare breed that's going to walk this out at the end of time. Join the army. Enlist. Get your mind transformed to understand what's going on. www.omegaministry.org. Hit support, then donate. Support doing the tabernacle. It'll rise up, but it won't be long. It won't be long-lived. It's going to be something to engage Get the folk ready, get them equipped, get out. Because he's going to burn this place up. The Bible says the whole world will be, will be dissolved. Seeing that all these things will be dissolved. We look for another city, another creation. There's another Jerusalem coming down to replace the one over in Israel right now. That's the bride of Christ. You know, the bride of Christ is really New Jerusalem, if you read Revelations correctly. Adorn for the husband man. And that's where we'll be, we'll be camped out. That's the camp of the saints coming down from heaven. To replace this there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth the bible says to replace this one you gotta get your mind prepared for that i mean who could adapt to that you know when this thing goes metaphysical and this dissolves away and you're gonna, you're gonna have a new body be a new you and everything is reset to zero again and you start over in eternity you got to get your mind adapted for that man because that's going to be a rude awakening to find out that Hell is hot, and hell is emptied into a lake of fire forever. But I just think, that's a, you think it's a joke or you want it, it ain't going to be funny when it happens. You got to be prepared now for then. It's a serious situation. Join the army. Get your mind. See, it's all about transforming your mind to accept what God is saying, and then he makes the renovations and the ad adaptations inside of you to get ready for it. He got to change us. You gotta, he's always changing. You're always evolving in God. You're changing from day to day because he's changing you to get you ready for eternity. And boy, it can be radical when he's addressing stuff in you to change you. That thing can cut through you like a hot knife, a hot knife through butter because he's getting stuff out of, you, out of you that's not like him and replace them. Sometimes, but it's necessary. Last thing, remember the conference coming in July 29th through August 1st down at Hammock Beach Resort in Palm Coast, Florida. Hammock Beach Resort in Palm Coast, Florida. We'll be down there for the Soldiers of Light 2021 edition. It's coming July 29th through August 1st. Registration is open now with OmegaMinistries.org. On the home page, click on the red and gold button up top. It'll take you through the registration and the hotel reservation process. Join us down there. We're going to be down there. We do it every year to get the saints together from around the world to come together just to worship God, be taught the scriptures, to actually pray and be delivered from demonic elements that are trying to intrude into your life. Four days of just dealing with you and also giving you some time for recreation and getting yourself uh, renewed and refreshed on the beach. Nothing like the beach, man, and the Atlantic Ocean to get you right. We'll be baptizing folk in the Atlantic Ocean Saturday afternoon like we always do. Baptism every Saturday. I mean, on Saturday down there. So come on down if you need to be baptized. And man, who, how many people get baptized in the Atlantic Ocean? We won't drown you in anything. It's the shallow water. You know, we don't go out into the deep, throw you off of a ship or nothing like that, you know. So we'll be baptizing you down, down, down there on Saturday. 
it's a good time, man, for your family, your kids. Everybody has a good time down there, volleyball on the beach, throwing the football around, throwing the frisbee around, and just sitting out there enjoying the sun in a COVID-infested world. August August 1st is the end of the conference. We'll begin in that Thursday, July, on July 29th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So make your reservations now at the hotel. If you want to stay longer, they'll give you the rates that we have, special rates if you want to come in like on Tuesday or Wednesday and stay through Tuesday or Wednesday. Just tell them you're there for the conference. And Because after that Sunday evening service, you're really not ready to go yet. You know, you need to knock another day or two to get right, to get your mind right, to head back home. So you hang on the beach a couple of days extra just to, you know, hang around and goof off and just lay out there in the sun and, you know, all that. So, you know, it's a lot of fun down there. Come on down. That's July 29th through August 1st, Hammock Beach Resort, Palm Coast, Florida, the Soldiers of Light Conference. All right, let's see here. I think that's it. I also remember Wednesday morning, latest Bible study. That's Wednesday mornings at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you contact Barbara at barbara.a.price at att.net, she'll send you the link for the Zoom meeting. It's usually posted on our websites, on the Omega Ministries website. You'll see that link for the uh, Wednesday morning latest Bible study. Also, Wednesday night Bible study is at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the Man Up meeting is posted on our website also on the Facebook site, rather. Both of those, all those links on the Facebook site, the Omega Ministries Group Facebook site. That uh, Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Man Up Leadership Conference meeting also on Zoom. So be a part of things. Plug in. We're here to help you, not hurt you. And we're, see, we're here to see you advance in God. We're going to get rolling here. Got a few videos to watch first. Then we'll get into the word for today. We're going to look at Jeremiah Poja giving you the algebraic breakdown of salvation. We're going to be kind of cerebral today. It's for the thinking people today. So we're going to look at that. Then we're going to look at the matrix breakdown, which is about 20 minutes, 28 minutes or so. We're going to go back through the matrix to show you how the matrix works because it's all leading somewhere. Now we're doing this on purpose to show you something. Then we'll end it with a rite of passage video, which is about seven minutes, telling you about a rite of passage as we talk about the lion of the tribe of Judah today. The lion of the tribe of Judah. So take up a quick offering here, and by way of the internet, if you give them over the internet, go to omegaministries.org, top of the page in the toolbar, click on support. In the drop-down box, click on Donate. It will walk you through the contribution process, and we appreciate you giving. Be right back at you in about five minutes with today's message. Stand by. All right. Let's get rolling here. So first of all, we're going to look at these videos. Like I said, the first one is uh, Brother Jeremiah Poach. information about how the gospel can be put forth as an algebraic formula. It's pretty interesting, you know, how it works, how he designs it as a mathematician to show you what happens to you in your life as the gospel interacts with you negatively or positively. You know, the gospel is interactive either way you do it. The gospel is working on you whether you know it or not, saved or unsaved, because Jesus Christ is the is the uh, arbiter of all truth and your response to him determines the outcome in your life. You negate him and leave him out of your life, you still are interacting with him. You just don't know it. See, the word of God is the arbiter for all life and how you respond to it, if it offends you, if it makes you feel put out or whatever, that response to that word will determine your outcome. See, folk think it's just something they can just pick and choose and refuse and if I do, I do. And if I don't, I don't. No, it don't work like that. That's how people go to hell. It's millions of people in hell right now because they thought it was a joke. But man, the gospel and Jesus Christ is always in play. Okay, what a Buddhist or a Hindu says, they're interacting with Jesus just negatively. Think about what I'm saying. You always interact with them negative or positive. And that this algebraic equation that uh, Jeremiah Poja walked out, worked out, tries to uh, illustrate that. Next, you'll see 
a video concerning the matrix. This is very interesting. Listen to the dictates of the matrix because it's going to fit into the message today. How the matrix is always in play. And the matrix is a mind controlling symposium to keep you trapped in time and space. The matrix is something designed. It's not just helter skelter. It's been designed and you're born into it by way of the corruptible seed your daddy planted in your mama. Remember, you had corruptible seed that conceived you. You're gonna, this body gonna rot. It's corruptible. So you, the matrix was designed by Satan to house the corruptible seed and keep your mind bound to the matrix so you never serve God. So it's formatted, it's designed, it's well thought out and planned to make you believe you're free while you're still indeed a slave. It's ingenious. It's ingenious what this boy did. The devil is an ingenious creature now. And he's not somebody to be played with because his mind is way ahead of ours. And nobody's mind could top the devil's mind except the mind of Christ. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the mind of Christ. So you got to get your mind hooked to the mind of Christ in order to overcome the devil and outmaneuver him in a master chess game. This ain't checkers. This ain't Barney Fife and Floyd at the barbershop playing no checkers. <laughs> this is a chess match. And these jokers that try to confront God think up a lot of stuff. You look at the stuff they're doing now. This is, this is very scientific what they're doing now. So most of the world can't even figure it out because it's too planned out. Bill Gates thinks he's a genius. They're smarter than God. And his mind is like a sugar ant compared to God, but he thinks he's a deep thinker. He thinks he is a God, and so he don't need God. That's a bad mistake. A lot of folks have thought that. Hitler thought that. Where's Hitler today? A lot of folks on the landscape of history thought they could outthink God. And look where they are now. It's a crying shame. And this last video is about rites of passage. I'm going to show you the significance of, of rites of passage, passage today and what that really entails. So pay attention, and then we'll double back at the end of this to show you how all this ties together. So let's get rolling here. I also want to tell Kamani, happy birthday. He turned, what, 12 today? Man, you're getting old, man, old and rusty. You're 12 years old, boy. <laughs> One more year and you'll be 13. That's the crossing over season now, man. You'll be in puberty. <laughs> Need you to come and do something. Lift, lift some boxes or something around here. It's your old self, man. <laughs> but happy birthday, Kamani. All right. All right, let's get rolling here. Father God, we thank you for this time and sharing. Thank you for the word of God. Take these words, God, and these video presentations and use them for your glory. It's time for a new breed of Christian to rise up and stand up in the midst of an austere, filthy world that's against you. Somebody's got to be for God and somebody's got to represent you in this dying arena we live in. These folks are losing their minds daily. Insanity has become the status quo. Their media presentations, their music, their movies, the TV shows, everything reflects the insane nature of the human mind. God, we got to keep our minds staying on you to have perfect peace and to stay sane. A Christian is fighting like a madman to stay sane in an insane world while the lost sinners think they don't even need God and they've already gone crazy. Sitting up in a college as a professor with a PhD, insane, thinking you understand things and you've lost your mind already. God, it's time for the church to stand up, have the minds renewed, be transformed in the inner man, and move out to accomplish the purposes of God as our minds are yoked to your mind. Everything we do, God, is to provide information, knowledge, and understanding to change the minds so folk can think clearly. Getting out of self to serve God. Selfish folk cannot serve you. We got to be set free from self in order to walk with you and see your world come alive in our world to see Jesus magnified and crowned Lord and King of all. So God, we stand aside, we step down from the thrones of our hearts to allow Jesus to ascend into our lives and take over. God, it's time for a new breed of Christian. It's time for religion to go away. A lot of folk can't stand up under it because they've been programmed and brainwashed by religion to believe church is a certain way. 
and the light is just too bright for them. They don't stand in the light because the light is too bright. But hey, we can't control that. We've got to do what we've got to do in these last and evil days. God anoint and appoint those you've chosen for such a time as this, like you did with Esther, and send us forth to do this end time job. And we'll give you the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's watch this and we get into the word. Called linear relationships, where we are taught the correlation between two variables that have a consistent rate of change. This presentation will illustrate how relationship with Jesus Christ will impact the trajectory of someone's life. During the course of this presentation, I will try to break down this algebraic illustration of life with and without Jesus Christ. I will be discussing slope from trend lines and how different people's lives are reflected using a Cartesian plane. But before we can break down this illustration, let's talk about how we form this linear relationship. It is not realistic to use a straight line to illustrate a person's life because of the ups and downs we go through. But we can use a scatter plot in order to illustrate the linear trend values of two variables are plotted along two axes. The pattern of the resulting points revealing a correlation if a correlation is present. Based on this scatter plot pictured, we can see that the height and weight of this person increases with a positive correlation, meaning as the person gets taller, their weight increases. If we were to make a trend line to illustrate this scatter plot, it will look like this. Now, a linear relationship is a term used to describe a straight line's relationship between two variables. Linear relationships can be expressed either in a graphical format or as a mathematical equation in the form y equals mx plus b. You may be very familiar with this equation from grade school, but now let's elaborate and go a little deeper. Each letter in the equation y equals mx plus b represents something. y and x are the most common. x represents your input, and y, after everything else is calculated, is the output. The M represents the slope of the line, and B is where the line crosses the Y axis, or the starting point. One day I was meditating on this equation, and I believe the Holy Spirit showed me how this linear relationship can be used to illustrate someone's life with and without Christ. The same equation, the same variables, but look at the different implication. Now the X being the input represents the years of, of someone's life. The Y, the output, when it's positive, is trending towards relationship with God. When the Y, when the output is negative, is trending towards depravity, away from God. The starting position is representing of when someone is born or when they're born again through salvation in Jesus Christ. Now this slope, the M, when positive, when it's trending upward, the ratio of slope, which is usually the rise over run in math, the rise indicates seeking God. Self-righteousness keeps you going horizontally. Same thing with the negative slope. The rise, or in this case, the decline, the fall, represents sin as your numerator in the slope ratio. And also, self-righteousness will still keep you horizontal, but you will be trending downward because of your numerator being sin. Now, let's talk about the measure of the steepness of a line from left to right. So like I said before, we calculated rise over run, how much a line goes up or down compared to the horizontal movement. And mathematically speaking, it is known as the change in Y, which is the vertical change, divided by the change in X, the horizontal change. So slope is always a representation of 
Elevation compared to horizontal movement. All right, let's talk about the different types of slope. First, we have positive slope. Now, as you can see here, the line is going up from left to right. As the Y value increases, the X value is also increasing. Therefore, you see an upward trend. The negative slope, as you can see from left to right, it is going down because as the X value is increasing, the Y value is decreasing. So we're going to use these concepts a little later. And the last thing I want to show you is zero slope. As you can see, there's no, um, no vertical change. It's not, this line is not going up or down. It's just progressing at an even pace left to right. So that has no rise or no decline. Now, when you have a line that has either a positive or a negative slope, it usually fits in one of these four categories. The top left image, you see a positive slope with a and it's very steep. On the top right, you can see a positive slope, but it gradually goes up. On the bottom left, you see a, a negative slope, which is trending downward at a faster rate. It's very steep, but it's going in, in the negative direction. And also the bottom right, you see a negative slope, but it's a gradual decline. Usually you can um, describe a slope with either positive or negative, a positive or negative slope with one of these four types of steepness. Now let's talk about the Cartesian plane used here for the illustration. One of the most important things to recognize is this x-axis. Now this x-axis represents two things. One, it represents your life at any point. Number two, it acts as a barrier between works done in Christ and works done without Christ, which head towards depravity. Now anything up that is in a positive direction above the x-axis is trending towards a relationship with God. Anything done below the x-axis apart from Christ are trending towards depravity because without Christ, there's no way we can please God. So, now that we know what each quadrant represents and how to measure the steepness of a line, we can see the trends of different types of people using this, using this Cartesian plane. Here we have a person who is trending towards self-righteousness. This person is saved. They have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but their, their works, their actions trend more towards self-righteousness than towards God. This could be a person who does a lot of things of their own will and to please themselves rather than to please God. Although they're, they're saved, they're above the x-axis, they're not trending towards God. They have a gradual incline. This next person has their, their, their dots trending more directly towards God. And as you can see, um, scatter plot, you can see that this line has a steeper slope. Therefore, they're trending towards God at a faster rate. So it's more of God and less of self. These last two people are people who have not received the Lord Jesus Christ. And this person, based on their life, they're trending at a fast rate towards depravity. They have a slope that is negative, a lot of sin in their life, and they are just trending downward. And this last person, although they're trending down as well because their works without Christ are, are not going to be godly works, they are, their slope is a gradual decline because they have what we call good works or self-righteous works that they deem is righteous. So although they're just as unsaved as the person who's heading toward the depravity at a faster rate, since their deeds aren't as as um, devilish as the other person, their slope trends at a slower rate towards depravity. 
Let's look at three different types of people who are unsaved. This first person, as you can see, their, their line has a, a, a steep slope heading in the negative direction. This person is sinning at a high rate and they're headed directly for depravity at a fast rate. This middle person has a mixture of sinful behavior and self-righteousness. And although they're still heading into the same place as the first person, it's more of a gradual decline. And the slope is, it might be pretty equal with the sin and the self-righteousness as a ratio. This third person, although they're still unsaved and without Jesus Christ, they're, they have a really gradual decline. And a lot of the things they do are we will consider self-righteous or good works. But as we know, the Bible speaks of any good work outside of Christ is a dead work. So all three of these people may be trending at different rates, but at the end of the day, Without Jesus Christ, they still will remain unsaved and cast into hell. This first person is saved and they seek God at a faster and higher rate than anything else. Any self-righteousness, any self. So their line trends at a steep, fast rate towards God. This middle person, like, like just like the person be below the x-axis, they're seeking God and self at the same rate. So although they're elevating, they're elevating at a more gradual pace. Now this third person is a person who is saved, but they seek more self than God. So they don't display as many fruits and attributes of a person who has been spending time with God and growing at a fast rate. So although they receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they stay horizontal. They stay more like that slope we talked about earlier that has no increase. And there are some people who are saved who have a horizontal line with no, no increase, no elevation, and they just remain earth-centered and headed towards self-righteousness and never really excel in the things of God. So now let's take a look at the image and all of the different linear relationships indicated here. So we talked in depth about the six different people, but now let's focus more on what does it take to get from below the X axis, these red lines heading towards depravity and hell. What does it take to become one of these blue lines? And once we become one of these blue lines, which line do we want to be? So first and foremost, we talked about earlier, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but through Jesus. So until you re one repents of their sin and all of the evil things they've done to God, towards God, they can never be a blue line. Now, they may not trend towards depravity at a fast rate. They may look like a good person. But without Jesus Christ, you cannot be above the x-axis. You cannot live a saved life. So therefore... Receiving Jesus and being born again starts your linear relationship all over from the starting point because you have, you've been born again. So when you're born again, you have the options of how sincere you will be and how earnestly you will seek after God. So these three, these three linear relationships above the X axis show you different people and their level of seeking God. We want to be seeking God at a fast rate so we're able to display the fruit, the characteristics, and the power of a Christian living a life empowered by God. But the negative thing is several people in the Christian faith have slowly developing slopes where they're not trending towards God. They're trending more towards self-righteousness and self-pleasure that they never actually live out the victorious Christian life. They're not as fruitful and they're not able to win other lives because their life parallels closely someone who is below the X axis. So in order to be fruitful, we need to seek God. We need to continue to, to grow. What is the matrix? 
When that movie first came out in 1999, I remember the trailers and the marketing campaign said, The Matrix has you. I just knew I had to go to the movie and find out what The Matrix actually was. But when I left the movie, I was still confused and still had no clue what The Matrix was. One of my friends tried to explain it, but he really didn't know either. I watched the movie continuously for years because I loved all the action and fighting scenes. And as the other two movies came out, I just chalked The Matrix up to it being science fiction and not really relevant to me past the movie storyline. But years later, as I began to wake up from my slumber and I began to just realize how blind I really was, I decided to rewatch the series and I realized that the movie The Matrix was not science fiction. It was actually science fiction mixed in with non-fiction. It was based on truth. Now the storyline and characters were obviously fictional and the events were all science fiction, but the subtext about The Matrix, the message that they were communicating about The Matrix was in fact quite true. The truth is that from the time I was able to speak and learn, definitely during the time I first watched the movie, all the way until the time that I was awakened, The Matrix did have me. I was in the Matrix. It was crazy. And now that I understand what the Matrix is, I use it often as a metaphor to explain to others that were also caught up in the Matrix, which to no surprise was about 99% of the people that I used to interact with. I still use the metaphor often, but I recently began to question whether people truly understood what I was trying to convey. Do people really understand what the Matrix is, or is it one of those general terms that people like to throw around, like the way people use Illuminati. Most people don't know what they're talking about when they say that name, more than that they are referencing powerful people. I asked myself, was Matrix the same thing? So I feel that if I keep using it as a metaphor, but never really explain what the Matrix is, it's possible that people would still be stuck in the Matrix because they never truly knew what it was, so they can get out of it. So what I'm going to do is explain to you what the Matrix is, so that there could be no question and maybe it helps you understand the world you really live in so that you can focus more on what and who is most important and remove yourself from the matrix. Let's begin. The first thing you need to understand is that if you are alive today, then there is almost 99% probability that you are in the matrix. This is unless you are part of the families that have created it or you are in complete isolation from the rest of the world. The matrix is a prison. But it is not a physical one. It is a prison for your mind, which makes it more dangerous than a physical prison ever could be. In a physical prison, you know that you're there. You know that you're in prison. You see your restraints, your barriers, what imprisons you. What makes a mental prison worse is first, you don't even know that you're there. You don't know the prison exists, and that makes it harder to escape from. Another problem is, once you feel that you have freed yourself, freed your mind, you often find that you have just freed yourself from a corridor of the prison. But the mental prison of the matrix can be very deep and hard to escape. So depending on how far into the matrix you've been, it can be very hard to get out of. You need to review your education history. How much of it did you take in and believe? Then review your entertainment. How much did you watch and listen to? Analyze your friends. How deep are they in it? And how have they influenced you? Or your parents and family? How deep in the world are they? How much of the lies of the world have they eaten up and unknowingly exposed you to? These things are not really easily understood until after you have broken out many layers of the matrix. I just use all of that to explain to you how easy it is for you to be caught up by the matrix and not even know it. So what we're going to do first is use some clips from the movie and hear what the This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. Desert 
of the real. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us a human being into this. Okay, well, that doesn't really give you an in-depth understanding of what it is, but it does give you a foundation. What is the Matrix? It's control, but it's not about computers. We are not living in a computer program, but it is a program. What is a program? A program is a set of related measures or activities with a particular long-term aim. And that is what we are in. We are being controlled by a set of related measures and activities with a particular long-term aim. The confusion that the movie brings along is the war against machines, the artificial intelligence using us as batteries. That's what throws everyone off from what the Matrix really is. The Matrix is a world that has been designed to distract you from the truth. It is a world that has been made to purposely deceive you while at the same time it influences you to contribute to what right now I will just label as extremely negative energy to establish a new world order. Maybe that made sense to you, particularly if you have watched many of my videos before. But for someone new to this channel, let me give you some more background. To truly understand the matrix, you must understand the true conflict in this world. That is, Satan's desire to be like the Most High. Now, a part of the programming of the Matrix wants to tell you that if you believe in the Bible, you are controlled and deceived by the Matrix. The argument is that the Bible is used as a tool of control, but that is not correct. If that was true, then reading the Bible would be promoted to us from everywhere. It would be taught in our schools consistently. Those that believe the Bible is a tool by powerful families to keep us under control, you should really examine your theory because everywhere I look, I see the Bible being suppressed. People told not to read it. People denouncing what is in the Bible. If the Bible were a tool of control, none of that would exist. It would be read by the majority today and a majority of the world would know what was in it. Or let's even go back to the times of slavery. The slaves were not given a good education and not taught to read because there were many liberating books to read. No, the slave master in the Bible. It is a fact that if more people actually read the Bible instead of criticizing what they think is in there, they would understand that there is no way that the Bible is a tool for control. Things of certain parts? Absolutely. But this can be done with any book, not just the Bible. At this point, you may want to stop watching this video because you think I am lost because I believe in the Bible. What I ask is that you hear me out completely before you truly think what I'm saying is foolish. If you can't hear alternative opinions, then your grasp on what you think is the truth might not be as strong as you think. Okay, back to the point I was making. The major conflict of this world is that Satan wants to be like the Most High. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 14 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to be like the Most High. And so he is using powerful families as well as spiritual forces to try to bring about this goal. And that is what a new world order is. If you are a Bible believer, then you should already have somewhat of an understanding of this goal. But if you do not believe in the Bible or really haven't considered it, this may be foreign to you. If you want to investigate this on your own, just try to answer the questions of why the most powerful families on earth worship Satan. Ask yourself why they are always trying to spread their light feeling that they are the illuminated ones, hence where we get Illuminati. What light is it that they are trying to spread? I will help you out a little. Lucifer means light bearer, and they are aggressively trying to spread the light of Lucifer. 
This is concretely explained in the 33rd degree Freemason, Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma. But again, I'm getting off subject. The point you need to understand is that Satan is trying to be God of this world. And there are many that have sold out to him in order to help him achieve this goal. Watch my series on symbolism if you don't completely understand the sellouts. So anyways, understanding this goal will allow you to understand what the matrix truly is. I first explained that the matrix is a world that has been made to purposely deceive you, while at the same time it influences you to contribute extremely negative energy to help establish a new world order. But now that I've given you more background, let's exchange the words extremely negative with satanic. And you will now have a complete definition of what the matrix is. The matrix is a world that has been made up to purposely deceive you while at the same time it influences you to contribute satanic energy to help establish a new world order. That is the matrix and the Bible has told us that this matrix would be here in the last days. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 7 through 12 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the master will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, Elohim will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see that? The strong delusion is the matrix. The matrix has been allowed by Elohim to be in existence for those who do not believe the truth. We are in the times of strong delusion, and if you're not fully grounded in the truth, then the matrix has you. Now, this is easy for us to see when we examine the many atheists and unbelievers in the world, but that does not exclude the 1 billion proclaimed Christians in the world as well. I'm sorry to say that a strong majority of Christians today are in the matrix just the same. Remember, the matrix is a prison of the mind, and it's the mind that has been imprisoned. Satan did not just leave the church alone while he created the matrix. He infiltrated the church in many different stages of history and created new doctrines, new traditions that on the surface were said to be used to worship the Elohim of Israel, but in fact, they were made to worship Satan and allow people to unknowingly contribute to satanic energy. Do you know what day of the year contributes the largest amount of satanic energy? No, it's not Halloween or the day of the summer solstice. It's on December 25th, when a majority of the world celebrates the rebirth of the sun god, the day we know as Christmas. Watch my video about the history of Christmas to understand this more. But again, I'm getting off track. The Matrix is a world system that was created by the wealthiest families in the world over centuries. It is used to control our way of thinking and how we live. Listen to what Morpheus says about it. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born a prison for your mind.
software. They have used their wealth in order to control what we fear, what we see, and what we do. Before the modern world that we live in today, if a man wanted to feed his family, he would go out and hunt and bring back his food. He would find land and build his own home. He would raise his children and teach them. Today, if you want to eat, you need to earn money created by the Matrix. You need to buy food created and distributed by the Matrix, who then determines who gets the good food and who gets the bad food, all depending on how to decide to price the food. You can't just build on any land because they brought all the land and you need to buy it from them, again, with the money that they created. And let's say you had land. You still need to buy supplies from them from which they also control. Through control of money, they raised the cost of living over time, which made the women get jobs instead of raising their kids in the home. And if you even decided that you still wanted to raise your kid in your own home, you have to get permission and inform your state that you want to homeschool and you need to check in with them every year. You have to tell your government that you want to raise your kids yourself. And if you're not able to homeschool them, you must send them to their schools. It doesn't matter whether it's public or private because they create the curriculum that the kids learn. In their curriculum, they teach the kids to be good obeying citizens, respecting authority while keeping themselves the most powerful and wealthy people in the history of the world they keep themselves out of the history books. So the majority of the world public doesn't even know that they exist. If you think Bill Gates or Amazon's Jeff Bezos are the most wealthy people in the world, this is programming from the Matrix. There is a show on the History Channel about the men who built America. But it's ironic that this subject is never taught in our school history classes. They just sum this up as the time period called the Age of the Industrial Revolution. Our schools don't teach us about our money and how it is created and by who. They teach us that all we need to do is work hard and get a good education. They tell you that there are only two sides to politics and they select the candidates that we are to choose from while they control the issues, the candidates, and the agendas. They control the issues we talk about and when we care about things. They control our television and movies and only show content that they approve. They control our music gospel music too, and they control what we hear. They control our news, so we only concern ourselves with the issues that are important to them, and we will only know about the things that they want us to know about. They control our churches through censorship, placing Masonic leaders as pastors and teaching false doctrine tied into money and success, while they also isolate scriptures while professing the name of Jesus. They control our health through insurance companies, while at the same time, they poison our foods. They control all of our technology and devices and know more about us than we probably know about ourselves. I could keep going and going, but this is the matrix that has been created. It was created in order to create the world conditions for worship of a satanic false god that wants to be like the Most High, our true Elohim, Yahweh. And as they feed us with their false lies and keep us believing in their false system along with their false goals, we are being deceived and distracted from our true purpose. They create a love for unrighteousness. They create a tolerance for evil and an intolerance for righteousness and intolerance for the things of Yahweh. And so many of us are so caught up into this matrix and we don't even know it exists. We believe we can be part of their world while being a lover of Elohim, but this is not true. And the truth is, if we actually read our Bibles and lived through what it said, this matrix wouldn't have taken control of us the way it has. The Bible has told us not to love the world and the things in it. It tells us not to be of this world, that being a friend of this world means being an enemy of Elohim. It tells us to beware of men's traditions and philosophies, but we are not reading it and then we become deceived. The matrix then overcomes us. It controls the way we think and what we do. We place it in a higher regard than Elohim. While we do this, we are contributing to satanic energy that says that Satan has more dominion and control over this world than Elohim. The energy says that Satan has our hearts more than Yahweh does. The energy states that we wish to do our own thing and not be governed by our creator. All these conditions over time, all of the satanic energy building up over time 
contributes to the times becoming much darker and satanic until the new world order has come upon the world. And those who like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, those that believe the lie will be condemned. Those who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. An unfortunate truth is this goes for many that are in the church, many that have a false understanding of what belief in Yahshua is. Those that go to church every Sunday, that pay their tithes, listen to an hour sermon, and they think that this is what the New Testament church is all about. Those that are deceived by politics and the division of the political party lines. Those that are driven into race wars or income equality. Those that are deceived by things like Donald Trump, believing that he is a true Christian. All of these things are created by the matrix. And as you follow these things, the matrix has you. These things bring separation between us and Elohim and put us under a false narrative of the world. We believe falsely that we have voices and that our words and actions really count, like believing that your vote really matters. That is a belief that is brainwashed by the satanic matrix that we are consumed by. Your vote does not matter if they give you your candidates that you choose from and tell you the issues that you should care about. The matrix has you living in a dream world that truly does not exist. You do not have a voice in this world. The future has been decided long before we were ever born. All you can do is choose what side you are on and contribute to that energy. Bring more righteousness to the world. In the Matrix, you are a slave. And like the Judas of the movie said, maybe you feel that... Ignorance is bliss. But it is not. You are being distracted from true peace, true love, true freedom. There was a lot more to say on this topic. I wanted you to first know what the Matrix was. And I hope that now you at least understand what it is. Again, the Matrix is a world that has been made to purposely deceive you, while at the same time it influences you to contribute satanic energy to help establish a new world order. The only Commit your life to the Savior, the Messiah, that was sent to shed his blood so that we can be one with Elohim, so that we can be in communion with him through his Holy Spirit. Yahshua the Messiah was sent to the world to take the punishment of our sins so that we can be redeemed through him at our day of judgment. This world is a rehearsal for who gets to spend eternity with our Creator. You must submit to his ways and be redeemed. It's hard to break out of the matrix. I know it is, but the Father can open your eyes if you desire it to be done. The system seems overpowering and may be too big for you to take on, but that's just what the devil wants you to believe. 1 John chapter 4 verses 4-6 through six says, You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Remember that, he who is in you is greater than than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of Elohim. The one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the delusion. See, he who is in you gives you and come into the real world. And just like in the movie, the real world is not pretty. You are in seclusion. You are being attacked and provoked by your enemies. You do not live the same way that those in the Matrix live. As well as, like in the movie, everyone that is not in the real world can be an agent, an enemy of those who want to live in the real world. Everyone who is in the Matrix can be your enemy if they have not chosen to live through Yahshua. The real world from the outside can look boring and undesirable, especially to those that are so caught up in the matrix. But what you do not know about is the feeling of peace, love, joy that you have inside of you by being one with the Father, being aligned with the will of your Creator, letting His Holy Spirit guide your life, spreading His good news and bringing others out of darkness, bringing men and women to repentance. We were created to worship Him and in order to do this, you must break out of the matrix. 
This is a process and it does not happen overnight. Your desire to do this shows you love the truth more than the lie and you will receive your crown. After you have watched this, you now know that there is a matrix and there is a strong possibility that you have been affected by it. What should you do now? First, read your Bible. That's always my first instruction. Read at least a chapter a day, but you can read more if you want to. When I started to break out, I was reading like 10 chapters a day. Way. This may mean you stop going to church for a while until you have a strong grasp of doctrine, so you know what is right according to scripture and what is false. You can't go to church and not know what the Bible says. How do you know that that church is teaching the right things? Make sure you are not following religion, but are in fact following his word. You need to humble yourself and admit maybe you don't have as strong understanding as you should, or maybe you have been deceived and was blinded by it. You will stay in the matrix if you start with an attitude that says your deception has been minimal. When I broke out, I had to admit that I knew nothing, and coming from me, that was something very hard to admit. Another unfortunate fact is, the older you are, the worse you have been deceived. I know it's unfortunate. You've just been indoctrinated longer. Now, stop celebrating man-made traditions and celebrate according to his word, not in the direction of this world. Stop worrying about politics, racial and economic equality. Trust in Yahweh to be your source and he will sustain you. Break free from the educational boundaries you were taught and start asking more questions. I have a The link is in the description box. Above all else, pray to the Father in the name of Yahshua and submit to his will for your life. Break free from the strong delusion, the matrix, and be awakened. Focusing on Yahshua is where your mind belongs. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. Be blessed. Hello there. Let me get that adjusted a little bit. Uh, welcome to a virtual class uh, presentation for ME 200, uh, Adolescent Psychology. And today we're going to look at rites of passage. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I've got a, a very short little PowerPoint that I uh, slapped together here real quick to show you guys. I'm going to walk you through this and then let you get into uh, doing some writing about this concept. Um, here we go. Definition, first of all, rite of passage is a ceremony that incorporates religious spiritual beliefs into a cultural recognition of adult status. The rite of passage, in essence, gives you adulthood. It transfers those adult responsibilities and those adult rights and privileges uh, to the newest adults in the community. Um, that's the purpose of the rite of passage, but it does it within this religious and spiritual context. So a sweet 16 is not a rite of passage. That's a birthday party, right? We get the distinction. Um, I hope so. I'm going to go through four examples of rites of passage uh, for you to consider and think about. Um, the context of my examples, though, is not what happens today. It's more along the lines of how things used to be 500 years ago, let's say, 400 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, depending. Um, so every culture has a rite of passage. Every culture has a way to uh, take this information and transmit it uh, to the next generation and to make the next generation adult. Um, it is part of how culture is passed on. Let's keep going. Bar Mitzvah, um, probably the most widely known, I think, rite of passage. A bar Mitzvah is a rite of passage for Jewish boys. There is one for girls also called a Bat Mitzvah, B-A-T instead of R, Bat Mitzvah. Uh, anyway, this is done at age 13. There is ceremony and prayer and uh, with a rabbi uh, and, and within that ceremony, 
um, ultimately the rabbi um, recognizes the adult status of the boy and introduces this new adult to the community. Well, this is a great accomplishment. So what do you do? You party, right? <laughs> so you have a party. Um, and that seems to be a theme amongst uh, rites of passage. Let's keep going. Quinceanera. A quinceanera is a rite of passage for Hispanic Latina girls. It is done at age 15, hence they quince. That's 15 in Spanish, if you don't know. Um, this rite of passage incorporates Catholic mass and numerous traditional activities, and elements of it resemble a wedding. Um, frequently, a girl in her quinceanera will literally wear a wedding dress. Um, and that's, that's representational of, of the old school traditional meaning of a rite of passage. Uh, and that meaning is the father of the girl is pre presenting her as being available for marriage. What, at age 15? Yeah, remember, we're talking about three, four, five hundred years ago, available for marriage. Um, do 15-year-olds get married today? Uh, I hope not, but they do. Um, in my time out in California, uh, working at a middle concept and how I represented it and used it in uh, one of my classes and uh, was discussing this with a colleague uh, in the office. And one of the secretaries in the office um, kind of got in on the conversation a little bit and she said, they still do this. This is how it's done in Mexico, in remote villages far away from everything where they really live like 150 years ago than it does today. Um, they still follow this and 15 year old girls that they you're ready to get married um so that was fascinating to me uh, of course in my classes where i had 88 percent 90 percent hispanic students they didn't know this and that really kind of cracked me up they didn't know that it wasn't just a party for 15 year olds it traditionally was the father presenting their daughter as available for marriage. And that freaked out a lot of the girls in class, of course. Um, but then all the symbolism associated with that rite of passage really kicked in for them. And they got greater meaning out of those parties that they had attended long before. Um, of course, then, once you uh, have made that presentation, what do you do? You celebrate this new adult in the community, and you party again. Uh, let's go to the next one. Rite of confirmation. Now, this is a rite of passage within the Catholic Church, and they may not exactly present it as that. Um, some, some interesting things. There's no specific age for this one. It could be done as young as seven years old, up to 17 or 18. Every individual church or parish uh, makes that decision on their own. Sometimes they all follow the, the diocese, the bishop's area for uh, how to proceed with that. But every parish can decide on their own when they wanna do the rite of passage. Most common around age 14, uh, often tied to uh, promoting from eighth grade. Very common to have it done. Um, the ceremony itself is done as part of Catholic Mass, kind of like baptism is. In fact, the rite of baptism is done during Catholic Mass. So is this one, the rite of confirmation. Um, the main part of the rite of confirmation is the priest essentially, maybe not literally, but essentially asking the question, do you want to be Catholic? Think about that for a second. Why would the priest ask this? 
I mean, isn't it obvious? They've been going to church their whole life. They they went through the classes to go through right of con. Why would the priest ask this question? Do you want to be Catholic? Because the priest is recognizing them as an adult now. They are now an adult, and adults make up their own minds. They do what they want to do. They choose for themselves. This is not a matter of mommy and daddy telling them what to do anymore. So the priest will ask, do you want to be Catholic? Do you believe in all the things that we as Catholics believe in? And, you know, today, of course, if you're going through that process, you're not going to say no. You're going to say, yes, I do. I believe in all those things. Um, and with that, one of the other things you do in rite of confirmation, or it was traditionally done, is you take on the name of a saint, uh, and, and uh, it sort of becomes a second middle name. So uh, you get a new name here in, in the rite of confirmation. Uh, most people don't actually use that middle name uh, and, and make use of it, but it ceremoniously recognizes you are a new person inspired by one of these saints that was uh, in touch with God, and, and that's your inspiration for adulthood. Um, after that, the priest will introduce you to the church community uh, as this new adult, this new Catholic believer within the church. And what do you do after that? You celebrate with a party, of course, a party again. Now, uh, I'm going to go to the fourth example uh, for you guys, and that is Vision Quest. And I have to tell you, I can't absolutely verify the uh, accuracy of this information. This information was passed on to me by a Lakota elder 20, almost 25 years ago now. Um, it, it, is what it is. Uh, I, after I present this, I'm going to share something else about that conversation that I thought was very interesting. Um, so, a vision quest, uh, and, and that's kind of the Washichu name for it, I, I, I believe. But um, it's the rite of passage for Lakota boys. Uh, there is no set age, just like rite of confirmation. The medicine man the religious leader determines when it is time. And I mean, if the medicine man came up to you and said, it's time, and you're a boy in that village, you know exactly what he's talking about. It's the day you've been waiting for for some time, and you go. So when told to go, the boy's going to leave, uh, maybe with minimal water, but no food. And they're going to go out on the prairie and they're going to find themselves a nice tall hill and sit up on that hill and make a very, very, very small fire. And they're going to pray and they're going to fast and they're not going to sleep as best they can anyway for four days. I don't know that it's possible to not sleep for four days. Um, the point of all this prayer with the fire, fasting, limited water. Um, the, the goal is to have a vision. Well, of course, today they would say, well, you know, of course you're going to start hallucinating. That's, I mean, you're depriving yourself of sleep and food. Obviously, you're going to hallucinate. And, uh, you know, I I mentioned this to the elder. I said, well, don't they explain it away? And in touch with Takashala. So um, the goal is to be provided that vision of who you are to be as an adult. Who is the adult you? That's what you hope for in the vision. So four days. After four days, you return to the village and you pray with the medicine man. You share the visions that you have. And you, you pray with the medicine man to help interpret and understand what those visions mean. Based on that interpretation, a new name is given to this new adult in the community. Um, in fact, the old name is never spoken again. The little boy that left the village four days earlier 
is dead. That little boy no longer exists. That little boy has gone from the earth. Now there is a new man in the village, and a new man needs a new name. Oh, a new name, kind of like Rite of Confirmation. So a new name is given based on the interpretation of the visions, uh, and then that new adult is introduced to the village with that new name, and the village celebrates with, you guessed it, a party, a party. Now, these four rites of passages, rites of passage, were, were used to give adult status to individuals. Were they truly adults? Were they truly treated like adult members of the community? There's a lot of academic debate about that. Probably not completely, not completely. But I would venture to say they were a hell of a lot closer to being adult than boys or girls of the same age today. So, uh, given that, um, you, you could make the argument they were essentially given adulthood and adult status uh, back then through recognition within this ceremony. Um, you have some writing to do. Let me switch over to that, if I can. Do I have that here? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I think I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, I want you to define the traditional purpose of the rite of passage. Um, explain what, what it was about and, and why it was done. Uh, Writing assignments and all that. You don't want to do all that. <laughs> Just want to make the point about a rite of passage to get an understanding. One of the things that we in the Western world right now don't have, rites of passage, moving from your formative years growing up and transitioning over to adulthood. So we got people stalled out as permanent kids, never growing up. What you see in front of you is a bunch of folks that are resting in their development who never grew up. They know nothing about growing up, so they get stuck. You turn the lights up. Oh, they got to come up. All right. We're going to get rolling here. Take a look at this today. We're talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah, and we'll tie in those videos as we go through it to show you how it all connects as we deal with coming out of this matrix of a world and understanding that this is a controlled environment that has engaged your mind your whole life, you just didn't know it, to keep you seeing the world from a certain perspective that kept you basically institutionalized. You didn't know it, but what God is systematically doing is delivering you from evil and cutting the cords to the matrix. That's why a lot of people come in here and they don't make it through a service. Because what we say is so outside of the framework of the matrix and what they're accustomed to in religion that to watch a few videos, that's not a church. Man. The choir's supposed to sing, the guy's supposed to preach, make an altar call, sing again, and go home. See, the, the, the matrix got them. They've been pre-formatted and they've already been conditioned that church is done following these five steps. Anything outside of that is not church. So you see how it happens to you? Your mind can get so brainwashed by the devil's matrix that you've already pre-formatted everything as it should be, disallowing anything that intrudes into that matrix mind. Notice what he said when Morpheus, which means he, he was the god of dreams in a, a Greco-Roman Mythology, Morpheus was the god of dreams. That's who he represents in the movie. The, cat, the main, three main characters in that movie were Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity, the woman. Morpheus was the father, Neo was the son, Trinity was the Holy Ghost. 
So it's all representing, representing the Trinity of God and, and a savior of the world, which was Neo. But if you notice, when they were walking down the street with all those people passing by, he said, these people that are plugged into the matrix will fight for the matrix because they're dependent upon the matrix. And for you to talk against the matrix, you're talking against their source of living. That's what's happening right now. The government is becoming what? The source of life. Anybody beginning to give you $1,400 with no strings attached, it's strings attached. They're making you dependent. Now they're talking about a fourth stimulus. You, don't, you know that money is not real. This is the matrix. It's not real. None of it is real. It may take you a lifetime to break free from the fact that this is not real. Your mind has been conditioned to believe in the matrix and not God. The matrix was not created by God. I heard a young guy the other day trying to uh, validate that hip hop was valid in church. He said, well, we know that the devil didn't create hip hop because the devil can't create, only God can. That's a lie. That's a lie. The devil created the matrix. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, not the world systems. The devil created the world systems. He's the God of what he created. He's the God of this present evil world, according to Galatians chapter 1. God calls the world, this present form of it, the systems in it, the cosmos and the eons, the time periods and ages, what we call the epochs. That was another word in the matrix, epoch. <laughs> the ages are designed and created by Satan to keep the people that are birthed into it under his control. This is why you have to be what? Born again to get out of it. You're bound to the matrix by what? Birthright. But you got to be born again to escape it. God sent his son into the matrix to deliver us from what? The evil that binds the matrix. Deliver us from evil that's under the auspices of the God of this world. Religion is just another part of the matrix. It's an institution designed to make you believe you're worshiping the God of heaven when in fact there's another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit that's confined to the matrix. So you get a new age Jesus. You get a denominational Jesus. You get a Jesus that accommodates all sin, homosexuality, lesbianism, perversion. He accommodates it all. You get a Jesus that tells you once you're saved, you're always saved. This is, these are all Jesus of the matrix unconditional eternal security when in fact eternal security is right but it's conditional so you gotta not separate your will and your cooperation with God from God's sovereignty to save you you gotta receive the salvation if that wasn't true there's no need to preach there's no need to lead anybody to Christ and introduce Jesus cause God's sovereignty just saves them in spite of their will that's what they believe, but then they try to make it something else. That's the matrix. So you got to basically extricate your mind from all these puppet masters trying to control your mind. And the only way out is death. You got to mortify your members in the devil's matrix and die out. You can't walk out. You got to die out. So God injects his word into you and then death begins to work in you. So you might impart life to somebody else. Read what the apostle says. He says, death works in me that I might impart what? Life into you. The more I die, I'm able to transmit the life of God because I have nothing in this world that binds me to it. So I'm able to now be a conduit for God's life. But if the devil can find something out here that still binds me to his matrix, since he's the God of the matrix, I'm bound to the devil by being subjugated to his matrix. I got to get my mind unyoked.
There is a cerebral part of God's economy. There is an academic part. There is an educational part. You've got to use your mind to understand God and not back away from the information. Like what, what Jeremiah Poacher just gave. Most people say, oh, that's just too complicated. No, man, you need to go and study it. You need to understand it, pick it apart, make it make sense to you. It's value in it. But if you don't want to exercise your mind because you got a lazy mind, you'll just want to hear somebody preach and shout and run around in church and call that having church. You know what's wrong with you? You've been arrested in your development. I'm going to show you this now. Let's, let's, now, we've gave, given you the overview. Now, we're going to fill in the blanks and summarize it at the end to show you how it all works. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Now, we're talking about a rite of passage. That's going to be unraveled in all of this. Now, by definition, a rite of passage, we saw that, that uh, video last a rite of passage means what? Movement, right? Now, the word rite is actually short for ritual. A ritual of passage. A ritual of movement. You go through a ritual to move from one place to another. I'm going to lock it all together and show you this in just a minute. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Let's break it down first of all and determine the goal God is after. And then we'll fill in the blanks. Now, we're going to begin futuristically here to begin. I'm going to fool around with the baby stuff. This ain't pablum stuff now. We got to move the body across the Jordan into the promised land to con contend with the devil's uh, strategic armies that are very, very astute academically, and they are mental giants, not mental midgets. A demon or a fallen angel will all outthink you all day long. So God who designed all the physics and the geometry and the algebra and all the mathematical equations, his mind is like a huge semiconductor computer. You got a mind with God that designs universes. So you got to do what? Expand your mind. You got to let God intrude upon your mind and not be afraid of the esoteric metaphysical things of life because God's mind is expansive. You can't be afraid of the spirit world and overcome the devil because just like God, the devil is a spirit. You don't want to be out here free-flowing, unyoked to God and unfettered, trying to flow through a metaphysical supernatural world without being attached to God's mind. Because the devil got too many ways to do what? Deceive you. So first of all, through his word, you got to anchor your mind in God. And then move out into the spiritual world. Look at this. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said that word there is Elohim. The guy kept calling him Elohim. That's valid. God who is Elohim, which is the plurality of God, said, let us, 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 us make man in our image. So that's plurality now. Let us, Elohim, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost make man in our image. And what? After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So, made in God's image, and after his likeness, gives us the power to have dominion. When you lose dominion, it's because you lost what? The image and the likeness. Now, the image says that man somewhat looks like God. If you saw God, he'd look about like a man. He'd have feet. He'd have hands, eyes. See, folks try to tell you, you know, God is just a metaphysical, mystical, you know, esoteric spirit floating around. No, he made, he made man to look about like him. One man is nothing but a man that's been forced to be the image of a man in feminine form. You see, so it's after God's image and his likeness says you'll act like him. So you look like him and you act like him. That's when you know God by seeing the fruit of God in a person. You look like God and you act like God. Jesus said, 
when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When the world sees us, they, they should see Jesus. If he don't see Jesus, then he ain't got the right thing in you and me. See, you can pick out the character traits of Jesus in a person because you know them by what? Their fruit. They have the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the goodness, the gentleness, the meekness, the temperance, and the faith, and against us there is no law. You'll have the image restored, and the image that houses the Holy Ghost will then transmit the likeness. You'll have the fruit of the Spirit. So we'll, hang, we'll contain the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. We'll obey the Father. We'll have the image of the Son formed in us to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember, every image can be filled with the Spirit. If you got a demon, it's because you got an image that the demon filled. You meditated on something that the demon filled. You got rejected, and the demon filled the image of rejection in you. Now you walk around in a rejected spirit because it's in the image. That means the radical change in a person has to be conducted by and through the transformation of your mind. To eradicate what? The wrong images. Self-image. How you see things. How you perceive things. How you view a man or view a woman. All those radical changes have to be wrought in you by God rewriting the imagery in your mind. He said that this way in the Bible. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body to God as a surgeon. Present your body on this slab in front of me. I'm a surgeon. Present your body, how? As a living sacrifice. Offer yourself up to me in physical form. He says he's going to do what? Present your body as a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to this world. That you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Then it says in Ephesians chapter 4, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How you do that? You get rid of the images that house the spirits. That's why strongholds can deceive you. Because you don't know what image you're up, you have inside of you. Jesus told his disciples, you don't know what spirit you're of. You're talking to me, but that's the wrong spirit coming out of your mouth. You got to search through you via the Holy Ghost. Allow God to operate and spy you out with the Holy Ghost to show you what's in you. Words put images in you. How your mama talked to you. How your daddy talked to you. You were molested. There was uh, image changing events in your life. There were things that changed your perspective through all kinds of trauma based experiences that changed you. Low self esteem. Pride. Delusions of grandeur. All these things can come into your life through circumstances in your life. You can be castigated and cut down to nothingness and get a bad self-image, or you can react to being treated bad and get proud and get a hardened heart to protect yourself from being hurt again. That's a bad image. You don't understand how many things were molding you and shaping you in this life because the devil was doing what? Building a soulish creation for him to inhabit via his demons. The devil can't be everywhere all the time, but he has demons, an armada of demons that he uses by his spirit to find out what's going on. They spy out circumstances, and they report of hierarchy, chains of command, to tell higher level demons and fallen angels and Satan where the threats are on this planet because this planet houses his worldly kingdom. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but the world's systems belong to the devil. And he has governors to actually control these systems. And they always do what? Assess what? Threats. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. The Holy Ghost comes on him. Threat is unmanageable by all of us. I'm a demon at this level. I can't, I can't fool around with him. A fallen angel... I can't, I can't, I can't deal with that. This man has the spirit without measure, filled from head to toe. He's an express image of God full of the Holy Ghost, ebbing with power. So what happens? Satan says, boys, y'all step back. And he goes to see about Jesus himself. 
he was led to the wilderness to be tested of the devil. No other entity could deal with him, so he came himself. You can actually ascend in God till you be, you'll get to the devil throne level and devil will deal with you personally because you'll have that much power. You see how many people begin to attenuate into levels in God and then they fall because they finally got to the devil and they couldn't get past him. Because that joke will come different. You got to understand, you'll go through death and resurrections in your life as Christ is birthed in you and conceived and grown. But at every level, there's what? <laughs> A higher level devil. You don't get out, from, out of the world. If you're physically here, the apostle says what? I buffet my body. Lest after having preached this gospel, I become a castaway. Because I know this devil is after me every day. You're basically like, like a nail's length away in front of the devil all the time running for your life. That joke of fingernail just barely scraping your back all the time. And if you stop, he's going to grab you by the neck and strangle the life out of you. You have to be running for your life in this. The devil continuously attacks your mind. Your feelings brings folks into your life trying to thwart you, undermine you, do you in. You got to understand this is a warfare and everything is fair in love and war. Nothing's off the table as far as what the devil will do to you. You got to be fully persuaded in this. You can't be somebody playing church. This is the real thing. I tell folk, this right here is the real thing. We don't play church here. You've got to get your armor on. You better get some real armor with a real shield, get you a real sword, a real helmet, and be ready to fight. Because yeah. you enlisted in an interdimensional, extraterrestrial, metaphysical, supernatural warfare. And church folk are somewhere passively sitting around, listening to little sermonettes and crying and jumping around every Sunday thinking it's a joke. And the devil can only come for three reasons. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's all he comes for. Long term, he's either going to steal from you, kill you, or utterly destroy you. So how can you, you face off with him playing? And this joke is dead serious. While he's laughing in your face and telling jokes, he's got a plan already afoot to destroy you. Don't play with this fool, man, because he's serious about what he's doing. So you see now, a image and a likeness is what God is restoring us to. He's taking us back to what Adam was before he failed. You preach the gospel real mean or aggressive or, you know, I like the way you preach it hard and heavy and that's not what I'm doing. I'm talking like a guy to you. You're used to being around girl preachers. You've been used to, to in, uh, interacting with feminine guys. So just a guy talking to you like a regular Joe Blow dude seems like it's aggressive and hard and bold. You've been around too many feminine dudes. What is wrong with you? A guy that sensitive? And then the women who are accustomed to being around sensitive guys, they call loving and tender and compassionate. That's not a loving, tender, compassionate guy. That's a woman. You built a scenario around your life whereby you only interact with feminine guys and you think that depicts Jesus' love. It does, you better read about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus whipping people's butts in the temple, driving them out. A guy has characteristics that are warlike by nature. He has to contend with the devil to protect his wife, his kids, and his environment from the invasions of the devil. Yeah. So you got to have some tendencies of war in you, having done all to stand, you've got to stand there for armor clad. So now, if you just speak this thing plainly to folks, you use plainness of speech, now you're just overbearing. You're so hard. It was just so, I just had to leave. It was just so, it was just so aggressive. It seemed to be so militant. He sounded like a drill sergeant. That's your sissy daddy. All those sissy boyfriends, your sissy brothers, your sissy uncle, all those folk you interacted with, 
have taught you that femininity is normal in a guy. Buddy, you got to man up. You got to ask God to pull some testosterone back in you because the devil will walk up the front of you and down the back of you. He's not playing with anybody. He will kill you, your wife, and your kids. The devil will kill your kid tonight if you don't make a stand against him. You can't play with this. This is not a human. This is a cherubim angel. He has no human character. He has no love, compassion, empathy, nor sympathy for you. He will kill you. So you got to get some stand in you. God's got to pour some concrete into your hide. The world has been feminized. You can't see the news anchors are feminine. Homosexuals everywhere. They speak for everybody. Soft soap, tender folks everywhere. And they're supposed to be men with no stand in them. You've got to be delivered from that. That's a spirit that feels what? The wrong image of a man. The devil feminized the, engine of a, of the image of a man, then filled it with a feminine spirit. And now it's become so prevalent that now it's normal. So I'm hard just talking to you like a dude from the west side of Atlanta over there in Adamsville. A joker brought up to have to fight every day. A joker that had to be tested by the guys in the hood that made you stand up and fight. That made you have to stand for yourself and not bow down and cow down. You had to fight guys bigger than you. Guys that beat you to a pulp and you get up and kept on going anyway. This tender stuff, man, ask, ask football coaches now how they got to deal with tender guys with attitudes and feminine attributes, with long hair draped out of their helmets. This is pitiful. Prima donnas. A prima donna is a primary ballerina. Attitudes. Mad and angry because the coach spoke to me too hard. Now they got in basic training in the military. Time out for the recruits. If the drill sergeant spoke too hard, they raised their hand. I need five minutes to recuperate for how you talked to me, Sarge. Now I got to go over here for a smoke break to recuperate from your viciousness. You going to Vietnam with him? That's part of it. Who instituted that? Their mamas. They need time out. My boy needs to get a break from this vicious assault from the drill sergeants. God's got an army he's raising up according to Ezekiel 37. And here we are tender, sweet, and petite and can't fight. He's a Lord of armies. The Lord of hosts is a Lord of armies. You can't see that Israel was regimented in an army in the Old Testament. We're called the army of the Lord. And now everybody's afraid of a command. God don't make requests. God give, gives commands. Uh, per adventure, if, if you have time. <laughs> you don't see the Lord talking like that. Man, we got to get some folks that's ready to make a stand. All these boys raised by their tender, emotional mommies come out broken and accustomed to getting their way with no repercussions for it. But see, if you get saved as a woman, you can raise that boy as a man. Just give him to the Lord and let the Lord pour that concrete down into his soul. If your daddy won't do him, I, be, I bet you the Lord will pour it into him. And he'll give you the wisdom and the knowledge necessary to see that boy shaped into a man even if no man is in his life. And the church is supposed to do what? Replace that element. That's why a boy come in here. I'm not going to play with your boy. I'm going to tell that boy to step up to the plate and be forged into a man. Don't let these old whores take you down, bro. You're feminine if you give in to these whores. These whores define you. They can take your masculinity from you. They can make you subject to them and you become the submissive one to a masculine whore. Man, come on. What are you? You're not worth the dust it took to make you like that, bro. Talking about your sissy lust. I ain't studying your sissy lust. Get it out of you. But she's so fine. You tender on a little wimp, you. You slowly can wimp. You sell your birthright for this gal on the second row in your history class. Somebody need to slap you upside.
taught to a young boy like a man to forge him into a man to understand you got to have responsibility, authority. You got to be disciplined in this, bro. You got to walk this thing out as a man because God is dependent on you to be a leader. Somebody's got intestinal fortitude, not cowing down and bowing down to every skirt tail that struts by. It did in David. It did in Samson. It did in Solomon. And on and on it goes. Goes Ahab, done in by it. Adam, the corporate head of all humanity, done in by what? A woman. But what did they have? Nicki Minaj twerking in your face. Cardi B twerking in your face. Megan the Stallion stallionizing you. Beyonce twerking in your face. Rihanna twerking in your face. And you feed on that trash and all you do is have your, your, your masculinity siphoned out of you. What did Lemuel's mama tell him in Proverbs 31? Lemuel, my son, give not your strength to a woman. Lust siphons your strength out of you. Lust makes you into a little errand girl, not even an errand boy. You become subject to the masculine whore that's dominating you. You see, he shouldn't say things like whore. Shut up, wimp. <laughs> you wimpy self. It's not appropriate to say something like whore in church. Well, the Bible says whore over and over again. You can't even read the Bible. So you see now, we're talking about a rite of passage here when you deal with a movement, leaving one group and moving to another. Birth is a rite of passage because you left all the babies that are still in the womb behind and you came through the birth canal and now you're born. The birth canal is a passage. It's moving from one state of being to another. So you got a rite of passage through just being born. You have graduated steps in school. Going from kindergarten to the first grade is a, is a rite of passage. You left all the kindergartners that are still in kindergarten behind. You moved on to the first grade. You're expected to conduct yourself as what? A first grader. Because you moved on up, man. You can't act like a kindergartner no more now, buddy. You a first grader now. I always see kids in elementary school. I say, man, there's a first grader. You a first grader, aren't you? I can tell. I can look at you. You left that kindergarten stuff behind, boy. You a first grader. Now, how are you six? Man, you, you on top of your game now, bro. A first grader. That's how I talk to them boys. Let them know, man, you moving on, bro. You can't have, I know, stop all that crying and whining. You a first grader now, man. You a first grader. You can't act like a little whining, running nose kindergarten no more. You moving up. You've been weaned from breast milk. That's a rite of passage. When that baby don't want no more breast milk, that baby left that breast milk time behind. They moved on. They've been weaned from the breast. Graduation in schools were all rites of passage. You graduated elementary school. Sixth grade, uh, fifth grade stuff is gone. That ain't, my, that ain't my thing no more. I'm a middle schooler. And you, you address me as such from here on out? I am now a middle schooler. Go through sixth through eighth grade, graduate. Hey, look, I'm a high schooler now. Look, don't talk to me like that because I'm now a high schooler. See, they, the, the adjustments are being made through rites of passage. A graduation is a rite of passage. As a matter of fact, the uh, graduation is really a mystic type thing if you go to high school and college levels because you put on that square hat, which is the base of the pyramid, with an invisible cone on top of it, saying you're an apprentice. It's really magic. That's why you have a regalia. You know who else wears regalia? Witches. That's why the guys have all those tassels and hoods on the back of their robes, the higher level PhDs, because they're a higher level what? Sorcerer. You just became an, a, a sorcerer's apprentice. You thought you were a graduate when in fact you're Harry Potter. <laughs> they brainwashed you in these institutions and you graduated because you got your degree. Where, where else do they have degrees? In the Masonic lodges. You got a bachelor's degree, meaning you're an apprentice. Now you mastered your craft, you became a master magician. Now you became a doctor of your magic. See, all these things mean something. You just didn't know what it meant. It's a square hat because the, the pyramid has a square base. It's a, it's a lady witch in Africa. She said she got indoctrinated in sorcery. 
in part of her indoctrination, when she rose up in the ranks as a, as a sorceress, she was introduced to Satan. She said when she went in to see Satan, he sat under a pyramid. His throne was in the middle of a pyramid. And he had skin that was actually pale, no color to it. And she said he's a pale being. He's not red or black or any kind of a shade we know of as far as melanin content. And he's set up under a pyramid. You better know that if you got pyramids over here in Mexico and pyramids over here in Egypt and they're not even connected, that pyramid means something. Pyramids are power structures. They are geometric power structures designed to go inside of and pray through to open up portals to inv invoke the demons and the fallen angels to come across. The pyramid structure is Satan's way of carrying out his divination. Alistair Crowley wears a pyramid hat. You ever seen him? See, this is all about magic. Magic is really divination and calling upon the dark spirits to do your bidding and to empower what you're trying to do. This is the realm we're going in. The Bible is a spiritual metaphysical book. If you don't see all the supernatural things in the Bible, you're flying blind. God is a supernatural God. He operates above the level of the natural, and you just got to accept that and get full of the Holy Ghost to engage his enemies in the supernatural world and stop being afraid of it. You've got to let God feel you, and those portals of supernatural demonstration are going to open to you. And it's not all good spirits over there. So you've got to have the ability to do what? Discern good and evil. You need the gift of discerning of spirits. Because the devil will come wearing a Brooks Brothers suit and a Mary McFadden dress. He can be in your auntie that you love so much. And it's the devil talking to you. You've got to be able to discern what spirit that person is of. Or else you get, you'll get slicked and tricked. If you go into puberty, that's a rite of passage. A woman begins some menstrual period. That's a rite of passage. You can't treat her like a, like a little girl. She, that girl can have babies now. That's why Mary was engaged to uh, Joseph at 13, 14 years old. When they talk about a Spanish girl getting married at 15, that's about normal. But see, we've had this thing so messed up and perverted that these girls are able to have babies at 13, 14. Now they're waiting to be 21, 25, 30 to get married. And there's a lot of fornication in the middle of that because she's dealing with what? Youthful lust, youthful desires. She got things operating her just like a guy does that if he married younger, it would be fulfilled because they got married. Joseph was about 17. Mary was about 14. That's normal. But now we got this thing skewed way left. Now we're dealing with all this fornication and illicit sex and all this gutter rot because the social structure in the Western world has been altered and skewed by the devil to get injected, having uh, sin injected into the arena to get folk messed up. So puberty is a rite of passage. Adolescence is a rite of passage. You come out of adolescence at about 16, 17-ish, and the girls would go through what? A debutante ball. A debutante ball introduced them to who? Society. That was her debut. She came out. Saying, I'm a young woman now. I'm transitioning from 16, 17 years old of being an adolescent to young womanhood. And they had a debutante ball celebrated through a party and actually making her the star of the show, the one that everybody came to see and to pay tribute to as she was making her debut in the social structure. That's, that's gone. Now you're walking around just crazy and just twerking and drinking, licking, smoking dope. That's your debut. <laughs> your debut was at the club twerking. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. We don't have any societal recognitions of rites, rites of passage. No rituals of transformation, progression, and moving from one place to another. So nobody knows who they are. They got no occasions to look back at, to remember as a rite of passage. Adulthood, adulthood you enter into from adolescence. Then you go through another rite of passage, which is marriage. That's a rite of passage. See, to be a valid rite of passage, you got to start off in one condition, 
go through the ritual that makes you into something else, and then you're reintroduced back into society as the finished product, having gone through the ritual. So you come into the marriage ceremony as a maid. You know, a maid is an unmarried woman. It's not, it's not like a, a maid that's cleaning your house. It's not, that's not a maid. A maid is just an unmarried woman. A handmaiden of the Lord is an unmarried woman. So you come into the marriage ceremony as a maid, unmarried, not joined to anybody. The man comes in as a bachelor, not married to anybody. In the marriage ceremony, they transition right before your very eyes from being a maid and a bachelor, and they become a bride and a groom. That's the ceremony being conducted. And they come out the other side as what? Husband and wife. That's a rite of passage. They left behind the rest of the maidens and the bachelors. They left behind the other brides and groom who are going through the service. When they step out on the other side, I now introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. whoever. They went through what? A rite of passage and every witness and every attendee in the wedding bore witness to the fact that they went through that rite of passage. You see, you see, we don't respect any of that. We're just going to shack up. Let's just get an apartment together and lay up like two old, old, old saw dogs together. That's what you got down here, trash. Everything that should move you on and progress you and get you away from being arrested in your development is now undermined and laughed at and scoffed as a joke. Now you got two women going to marry each other. See how they turned it upside down? God's valid rites of passage have been just denied and made a joke of. And it's time to set this thing right. A husband and a wife go through having a kid. They transition from being husband and wife to becoming what? Parents, father and mother. Insemination as husband and wife. They go through gestation, which is the, is the transformation process, birthing, and then when the baby comes out, you became a father and a mother. That's a rite of passage. You're not, you're not the same. Some changed in you now. You've got different responsibilities. Those feedings every two hours are going to show you you've got different responsibilities. Because every two hours, and you lay in there trying to pretend like you don't hear it, and your wife looking at you like, you trying to define, who's going to get up? I got to go to work at 5 o'clock. I, I can't get up. I'll tell you, I need you two hours. <laughs> hey, that stuff be real. I don't know how people do it by themselves. Having a couple of kids with a wife or husband will beat you down. How you do it alone is a mystery before God. You women have kids like a lap baby and a one-year-old. I don't see it, man. When one is asleep, the other one up and vice versa. Then they have them back to back. Uh, that, that's a lap baby. She one, he's two, she's three. You married? No, I'm not married. I, I, don't, know how you, I don't know how you're doing that. I don't know. It's a mystery. Because I know it, it will beat you down with a husband or a wife. You see, it, it takes the grace of God for that kid to survive that. Because that parent going to be worn out, beat down to the ground. A lot, you love your kids, but sometimes you wish they would just go somewhere. Just leave me alone. I love you, but please, just go to sleep. Do something. Don't be giving that kid that stuff to put them to sleep. You better stop. You're going to get locked up. You're going to get locked up giving that kid that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you see now you go through these transitions rites of patches will by necessity change your world view it'll change how you view life all by themselves see a person that's jaw jacking never been through anything they don't understand what they're talking about an unmarried woman trying to teach you how to be a wife and a mother that's limited what she can tell you ma'am please be quiet because you don't know anything about this they got an imaginary thing in their minds about how it would be to be married. But, buddy, you get in the trenches in a marriage, you don't feel like doing this every day. 
It's got to be a willful act on your part to love somebody because sometimes I don't really feel like being bothered with this dude. You know, really, I wish he'd go somewhere. You, know, you, got, you got some friends to go bowling with or something or <laughs> something, you know. <laughs> That's the way it is. You don't feel like being intimate every night. It's just the way it is. You mature and you realize that that's just the way it is. I just go and watch this football game. It don't matter. I see you when you wake up. You know, I don't. <laughs> see, if a guy is not driven by lust, he's not walking around with an attitude. Like, look, y'all, you know, you're supposed to be my wife. And the wife's body is for the man, the Bible says. And it, you got a real wimp right there. He's a wimp. Ain't nothing that big of a deal down here. This is a temporary world going nowhere fast. You're headed to a grave. Why get worked up to a tizzy over this junk? It doesn't matter. Let it go. Let God mortify you until nothing matters and you can live in peace because you're not hyped up and psyched up to a level that is crazy. Look how messed up church really is now. What I'm saying, if I went to most churches, I'm crazy. You got no business talking about this in church. This is not, uh, because they got a pre-formatted, designed way of thinking about what they call church. God teaches you practical things in church. He tells you how to live in a practical sense. It's not some highfalutin, unattainable thing he talks to you about. He keeps it normal and he keeps it real so you can actually live it out. Man, it's time to get back to just normalcy again. It'll shape your worldview. Let's look at some of the things the Bible says about rites of passage. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. These are rite of, rite of passage scriptures, but you'd never know it unless you knew what God was after. 1 Peter chapter 2. Take a look at verse 2. As newborn babes... Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may do what? Grow. grow thereby. You got to grow by milk before you can get the strong meat. He says desire milk when you're first born again. Don't bite off more than you can chew. You need just milk. Then you'll graduate to pablum and, and baby food. Go through the process. Don't try to know what you know you don't know. Don't try to talk as an expert in an area that you have not experienced. Desire the sincere milk of the word. Go through the growth processes and the growth stages. It's no big deal. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Take a look at verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I spake, I, I taught like a child, I understood things like a child, and I thought like a child. That's people in church. They hear me say something, but they think like a child, so they can't even process the data because they think childish thoughts. It's unattainable. I don't see how that could happen. I don't see how anybody could feel like that because you're still a child. But when you put away childish things, you'll do what? You become a man or a woman and you become mature in a full stature to live this thing out. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And now abides faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, which is agape love, the love of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Man, we're getting back to rites of passage and we're getting back to growing up in God. He says, chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto what? Which is maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms with the S on it. There's more than one baptism. And of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, that's dunamis power, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Unconditional security person. Once saved, always saved person. That's not what the Bible teaches. Your will is engaged in this. You got to stay on the ship to make it to shore. You can't jump off the ship in the middle of the ocean. You got to stay on board. So you see now, you leave behind the foundational things, the doctrine of Christ. You go on to, to maturity and perfection. You don't lay again the foundation of repentance from dead words and faith toward God and the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands. Those are the primary things you learn when you first come in and start getting taught. But buddy, when you get mature, you don't need those foundational things laid in you again. Because you moved on. You mo went through a rite of passage into other levels of God. See, I don't, I don't begrudge people that come in here and they hear this, but they're still in a baby-like state, they shouldn't leave because we ebb and flow through all levels of maturity. See, we always ebb and flow. We deal with baby stuff, you know, adolescent stuff, adult things, real mature things. You got to do that in a lesson in order to ebb and flow to address everybody's level. You'll hear things that may be at a PhD level, but hey, take the notes. And attend to get to that level. You see what I'm saying? Because that's where you're going. Don't just cast it aside and say, this is crazy. I don't know this ain't right. This is, no, you just not that. You had not grown up. You've been around somebody teaching you little baby stuff for the last five years. When you should have grown up, you've been drinking milk. And you've been hanging around baby food. When in five years, you should be out there as a Star Wars soldier of light. If the disciples spent three and a half years with Jesus and they're turning the world upside down, how do we spend 25 years with Jesus and got nothing? That's not even practical. There is no more power in Jesus standing in front of you in real time than you will pick up from the Bible in front of you. The living word Jesus in front of you is the same as the written word with the anointing of the Holy Ghost on it. It's the same thing. No difference made whatsoever. It'll have the same impact if believed upon and walked in. The living word and the written word come from the same source. So if you ingest this Bible or the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it will have the same impact as you sitting at the feet of Jesus personally and listening to him. Having not been mixed with faith, it has no impact. I don't believe it when I read it. I don't look at this Bible that's talking to me personally to shape me and forge me into the image of God. And I don't ingest every word knowing that this is having an effect on me. It's changing me, molding me, shaping me, moving me on in my mature maturation process. Hebrews 5, 14. Hebrews 5, 14. Look what he says here. But strong meat belongs to who? Them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, mature. They've exercised their senses to detect good and evil. See, when somebody's evil, you'll know it within 15 seconds. They say one thing, no, devil, back off of me. No, go ahead on with that. You can pick up evil quickly. If Deke goes out in the lobby and a guy comes up to him and says, can I help you with your bags? He can't discern that's evil. He don't, yeah, yeah, go ahead and help him. Thank you. There's something wrong with Deke at that point. Now, the guy and Deke got to get off him around me. Because my sense is an exercise to discern good and evil. Now, if you buy into that, it's just because there's something in you. See, this is real. The devil is always doing what? Walking to and fro like a roaring lion, seeking whom he what? May devour. May devour. He's tracking you to see 
He's sifting through you to evaluate, do I have something to work with here? And I tell folk, parking yourself in a garage don't make you a car. Getting in the oven won't make you biscuits. Sitting in here won't make you a saint. It's an inner work that's got to be wrought in all of us. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. The Bible is real. It says that Jesus Christ, chapter, uh, verse 9, now what is it he that he ascended? What, now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. That they might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. The maturity and the maturing of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Why? What work will you do? For the edifying of the body of Christ. You'll build the body. He's dependent on you and me to build the body for him. So he'll mature you to be able to build the body, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Is somebody waiting outside the door today when you leave here to deceive you? There's a devil five steps outside of that door taking time to get the word sown in your heart out of you by some junk that's going to break out right out there. You won't get down the hallway. Before a phone call comes or get into the car and somebody says something contrary and stupid or tells you something about something that happened and the devil comes immediately to take that word right back out of your heart. That's why you got to hey, look, uh, I just got the word. Don't talk to me about that right now. I meditate. I'm chewing on this word, meditating on it. You know what meditation is, right? It's a cow chewing on this curd. See, a cow digests uh, grass by regurgitating it over and over again and chewing on it. That's why you see a cow move his mouth in the field. That's throw up. He threw up back in his mouth again. What's he doing? Getting all the nutrients out of that grass. Then he'll swallow it, throw it up again, and chew on it again. Then he'll swallow it, throw it up again. You know, penguins feel the, uh, feed their young that way. They throw up in the baby penguin's mouth. That's what it means. Meditation is what it means. It means to keep on bringing up into your mind what God put in there and just chewing on it. Because you'll find the word of God is vast and it's rich. You can read the same scripture 35 times and get 35 different things out of it by chewing on it. You say, well, you know, I saw in that Bible. And I read this 20 times, but yesterday I saw, man, I, I never looked at it like that. But that's how it works. You're chewing on it. See, while you meditate on the word, other folks are fooling around in the world. They meditate on what they heard on CNN. They don't grow because they don't chew on it. They don't meditate on it. So they stay a little baby, always talking about meaningless trite from the world. You got to break out of that, man, and keep moving for you. So you see now, he wants you to edify the body till we come to a perfect man. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, while, while men wait craftily to deceive us. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And love is selflessness. You can't be selfish in love because God is the spirit of God flowing through you. And a selfless person cannot have the spirit of love flowing through them because the cholesterol of self blocks the flow of love. Selfless people can love Selfish people cannot love because they cannot provide a conduit for God to flow through them to manifest God. 
is not a feeling, it's a presence. God is love. God will tell you a lot of things that don't appear to be loving, but it's God's love for you that even told you the hard things. But you want to feel like he loves me because he spoke to me so tenderly and so, so compassionately. And he shows us empathy and sympathy for my situation. And I could feel the love, the love. You felt the love? That's the devil. Because <laughs> the devil ain't going to tell you the truth. He's going to make you feel good. You don't believe that? Think back about that lying dude to try to get into your pants when you were growing up. He made you feel real good. Here, when you walked in that room, when you walked in the door, you sent had an impact on my life like you made when you walked into the room. Girl, I'm telling you the truth. I'm ready to get married right now. I'm putting a ring on your finger tonight. And you said that, really? You just that dumb as a box of cornflakes. <laughs> you ding bat you. You went for that jump? You must be a track star. Cause you've been running through my mind ever since you came in here. You just that corny, you corny dunce. Get out of my face. You really? I was running through your mind. <laughs> that's so. That's just so unique what you told me. You Ellie Mae Clampett looking knucklehead. You. <laughs> that's the dean bad stuff you went for. You went for it. And then the guy ripped your heart out and left it to, left it for you on a platter. And left you there laughing at you, telling the fellas, the fellas about what he did to you. It's time to grow up out of the dingbat stuff. That Nicki Minaj, uh, Cardi B stuff ain't real. Those girls are miserable. You think they happy? You think Beyonce is really happy? You don't go walking around butt naked for everybody if you're happy at home. You still need attention and validation from the world because you're not happy at home. You settle down when you're finally satisfied because you're not looking for anything to validate me. You ain't got to admire me. I don't need your compliments. I'm fine. But boy, if you're still looking, you better check yourself out to find out what's wrong with you because you got an empty hole in you that the devil's still trying to pour stuff into. That vacuum is inside of you because you have not been made whole. When God makes you whole, you don't need any outside validation of you because I'm whole inside. If you're not whole, you're searching for somebody to validate you, trying to feel some kind of a way, and you're just a nomad and a vagabond wandering through life with no end to your search. I'm not living like that. Look, make me whole. So I don't need outward validation and outward conformity to my environment to make me feel better about myself. I got to be a member of a herd and a group to feel accepted and loved and appreciated. That is tragic trash is what that is. Ephesians 5, verse 27. He says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's how God wants to present a bride to Christ. Somebody extracted from the world, sanctified and made holy to present to his son, somebody who didn't love the world and really came out of it and got cleansed from it. That's the only church that there'll be at the end. So you got to make up your mind. Are you in or are you out? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. We always go on the journey through the Bible, y'all, because the Bible is the source. Not looking for outside sources. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Take a look at verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He is taking you back to a virgin-like status to join you to Christ. Not an idolater, not a whore or a whoremonger. I'm going to clean you up to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin. Forget those things behind. He's making you over again. Everything is now what? Made new. Old things passed away. He's renewing us day by day, little by little, washing us off to make us clean and pristine enough to present to Christ. Second Timothy chapter two.
what he is. You got to see what God is after and preach that. I can't preach the status quo. I got to keep the body moving because we're trying to get out of here. If we're moving out of here. We're not staying here. Second Timothy. Take a look at chapter two. Verse four. No man that wars and tangles himself with the affairs of this life, that it may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is, is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. If you're going to be a gardener in God's garden, you must first partake the fruits of the garden. You got to be endowed with the character traits and the characteristics of God to actually labor and produce after your own kind. You can't be full of hatred and vitriol and produce love. You can't be uh, full of impatience and, and produce long suffering. You can't do it. So you got to show forth the attributes of what you're trying to represent and trying to present to God and reproduce. You got to become the thing that you're wanting to reproduce. You got to have interactions with people to work out the stuff in you that's lacking. That's why you get married. Your husband or your wife can work out a lot of stuff in you that's messed up. For real. For real. Sometimes you do some long suffering with some joker, man. This dude here is crazy. But I'm showing long suffering and patience, Lord. I'm still praying for him. You got a crazy, but I'm going to pray and I'm just going to shut my mouth and believe on you. That's how you got to do it. It's producing a fruit in you through practicum. You got to practice what you preach. What's God after? He's after people that's going to do what? Conduct the warfare. Exodus 13. Exodus 13. He needs an army, but he's got to fashion the army to be like himself in order to use us. He can't use that which is not like him. He needs the image and the likeness restored in order to have an army to fight through. Exodus 13, 17, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see what? War, War and they return where? That's what folk don't figure on coming to church. They don't figure me to stand up here talking about a war against the devil. I thought it was going to be motivational. Thought you're going to talk about prosperity. Thought you're going to talk about war. I didn't figure on war. So I went back to Egypt and the worldly church. I went back to sit up somewhere and pretend like I'm having church. Because they don't fight no war over here. I'm not a warlord. And I didn't want to get involved in that war talk. All that stuff about armor and a sword and a shield and a helmet. And all that demons and fallen angels and that devil. One, one lady parachuted into the website the other day saying, why don't y'all just talk about Jesus? <laughs> Stop talking about the devil and evil. And just talk, let's, let's focus on the Lord. You escaping from reality, ma'am. Jesus talked about the devil more than anybody else in the Bible. Why? Because to defeat your enemy, you must know your enemy. You must know his tactics, his strategies. You got to know what he's going to do. What he has done will tell you what he's going to do. You got to examine him. You got to look at this joker and how he's going to come and how he's come before. That's why the story is about Samson and David and all these folks are in the Bible. That's why he talks about Simon the sorcerer, Elamus the sorcerer, the woman possessed with the spirit of divination. He's trying to show you how this devil is going to come now. And he's going to change up on you. Don't come the same. You think about Jesus if you want to. The devil going to blindside you. Because the Jesus you're thinking about is going to show you the devil. That's escape. Because she don't want to fight a war. She want to get her hands dirty. He's going to teach your hands to do what? War against his adversaries. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed. You know what harnessed means? In military order out of the land of Egypt. They went under, up under command. What was commanding them? A cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They were under God. They was under his command. That's missing in church. 
Don't nobody respect command authority. You ain't got to worry about people. They don't respect command in the church. They don't respect God. So they try to do what? What is right in their own eyes. And they always get shipwrecked and they always end up destroyed by the devil because he's going to know when you got what in you? Rebellion. He gonna, he go, how, how does he know that? Because he got it in him. I know you a rebel. I don't care what you say. I'm a rebel and you better know one thing. A rebel knows what? Another rebel. You can talk that talk all you want. Talk all that old spiritual sign and mumbo jumbo. You got rebellion in your heart. And see, the devil is able to search and sift to find out where it is. Peter knew he was right. But, buddy, when it came time to represent Jesus, he was cursing Jesus like a dog and denying him three times. Because he mentally ascended to being something that he wasn't. He didn't actualize the relationship with Jesus. It wasn't the fact. He just did what? He fantasized. Fantasized ain't actualized. You can fantasize about knowing the Lord, but don't even know the Lord to be sitting next to you on a city bus. You can't play this, man. I say it over and over again. It's an individual affair, and you can't fake it. The devil's going to sift you. The devil's going to know the real you from the inside out. You can mentally ascend to being different, but the devil got your number for real. He's just going to orchestrate in circumstance to take advantage of what you are. It's all about a nature. Your mission in life is to eradicate the nature of the devil out of your soul so he loses internal control over you. You don't want this devil controlling you from the inside. You don't want him accessing your emotions. Yeah, your mama wounded you, your daddy wounded you, your first husband wounded you, and it wounded your emotions, and the devil knows that's a sore point in you. That's a tender place in you. So he'll keep on doing what? Taking that hot poker and just digging in it. You've never been nothing. You've always been ignorant. You've always been stupid. You've always been no good. You never have measured up. You've always been so dumb. Anybody can lead you around. He's going to keep on till you say, look, devil, I'm under the blood. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment is condemned. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord, and my righteousness come from Jesus Christ. That thing you're talking about is dead and gone. I'm a new creation in Christ because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, look and see, all things have been made new. You're not going to come with that jump from my past and accuse me of one thing. Because if you accuse me, it manifests the fact that you're the accused of the brethren, and you are the devil. And you're going to back off of me. You got to know who you believe. And you are able and persuaded that he's able to keep that. That you've committed to him against that day. It got to be a fact for you, buddy, not a fantasy. You got to shut the devil's mouth and let him know I'm not the one. We're ready to rise up against that devil and let him know I'm not the one. You got to be bold as a lion while being as harmless as a dove. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You change character based on what? What you're in front of. If you're dealing with a devil and an adversary, you got to rise up and let the devil know you backing off of me. And he always got to be on hot ashes with you knowing this joker might just go off on you. You stand there quiet and you're looking at that devil. I said, let me tell you something, devil. And they know that when you, trans when you made that statement, you transitioned over. And they knew they pushed you too far. That's when the devil started backing off. <laughs> I was mean, just I mean, I mean, trying to say, you know, yeah, right. You stepped up to me now. We got to take this to the nth degree. I didn't step up to you. You called me now. I listened to you, right? You talked. You had your say, right? All right, now let me tell you this. Let's see if you can take the return fire. Talking about what I did and what I said and what I wasn't. Let's examine you. Now they start examining they stinking, dirty, low-down life, and you see what you get. Now they're cussing you out. <laughs> Go ahead on. Did the devil make a fool out of you? Psalm 144. It's the Bible. Stay in the Bible. Don't ever leave the Bible. He said to preach the word, right? Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. 
and sound doctrine. So you don't leave the pages of the Bible now. Psalm 144, look what he says, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to what? War. To war and my fingers to do what? Right. If you ain't in it for that, you, need, you might as well just pack your stuff and go home. If you're not in here to conduct a war and fight, just go back home and knit your booties and leave this alone. This ain't for tenderonis. This is not for mama's boys and mama's girls. This is for warlords, folk that say, you know what? I enlisted in the army and I can intend to fight. I didn't go to basic training to get all this training to sit at home. During the Vietnam conflict, I'm going to Vietnam. I'm going to Saigon. in this thing to fight all these rites of passages you see in every aspect of life employee you become an employee then you go through a rite of passage to a supervisor or a manager what's the difference you got responsibility and, 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 and irresponsibility pitted against each other notice how irresponsible people can ever identify with the responsible people have you no, track it people who got no responsibility cannot walk with a responsible person. If you're a bomb dude out there laying around with every woman in sight, living a life of a fornicator and an old dog in the street, you can't identify with a righteous guy that's responsible for his family. Or he's providing, he's nurturing his kids, he's doing the everyday activities of a man and a husband and a father, and you just the old playboy bomb in the streets. Y'all got no compatibility. A whorish woman can't identify with a virtuous woman. You're a young girl in your 20s, and you're you not out there fornicating and laying around with guys and, and all these old whores girls around you. They don't like you. They don't want to have nothing to do with you because they know any given day of the week you could become a whore, but they can never become a virgin. See, once that's gone, it's gone. Any day I can be you, but you can never be me. That's unstated truth. That's what they don't like about you. The cleanness, the purity, the pristine nature of your heart. They don't like you because they can't be you. You don't have to be proud and arrogant about it, strutting around like, I'm a virgin. Now you're proud and crazy. But the fact remains if you have not laid down your standards and been defiled by fornication, you can always be them any day of the week. But they cannot be you. Embrace it. Like it. Wear it as a badge of honor, but not a badge of pride. Because it's the Lord that keeps you. Because you could have been crazy without him. Irresponsible people, rebels are always self-centered. They think about themselves all day long. And they're always posting on the internet, showing you their face with some kind of a backside shot, looking, looking over their shoulder that they don't put. What kind of a nut does that? Don't nobody want to see your behind. Why are you doing that? The Kardashians get married and have kids and still trying to get naked. Why are you showing everybody your naked behind? Don't nobody want to see you? What's wrong with you? They're self-centered. They're so into themselves and so insecure that all they have to give people is their naked bodies. And that's their whole identity. That's a pitiful state of being right there. And that's the status quo for a lot of people. Look at them on the, on the internet and on social mediums. That's their profile picture. That's a, pitiful, that's a pitiful thing to watch right there. That's pitiful. What's that a sign of? Arrested development. Because of no rites of passage. They haven't gone through any steps to mature and grow. And to expand their borders and expand their minds and just grow up. See, some things drop off of you even unsaved. You went through your days of running around at the club, smoking dope, at the party. When you begin to get like early 20s, mid 20s, that stuff drop off of you. I don't want to get, well, I'm in this mess. Let me get out. This dude's stupid. No, just running around and partying and drinking and having fun. And it's more than life than this trash. And you, that'll drop off of you just by growing up. You see somebody 35 with a backwards cap on, walking around the street, listening to Lil Wayne and Jay-Z. That joker's still a boy. 
And then they come as boys and try to import that trash in the church. Your problem with that hip-hop trash in church is you still a boy. Grow up. Take them old baggy pants off sagging. Go get yourself a haircut like a normal dude, man. What you got on them old nap knots on top of your head for looking? Go get a haircut, bro, and become a man. When you were a child, you thought as a child. Now you're a man. Put away childish things. What you trying to fit into, the insane asylum? I saw a boy yesterday in that barbershop. His mama finally brought him in there to get a haircut. That boy had so much hair on his head, I could have made 10 wigs off of that hair. <laughs> and the, dog, the, the, the barber just, I'm thinking, dog, he's like shearing sheep up in there, bro. I mean, that, that little boy had some hair. But when he got through the haircut, boy, that boy, line, that boy was sharp. That line, man, that boy had was laid out. Of, had some waves in his hair. Handsome little fella. But walk around looking like ignaps. <laughs> with a nap, with a nap, not trying to fit in with the other nappy headed ninnies. Why are you trying to fit? Why don't you set your own standard? Why don't you get your own thing going, man? Why don't you be the standard in the environment and stop trying to follow the standard? Why you got to use the media and folk out here that are crazy as your standard? That's how people get covered in tattoos. Nobody sits around with magic markers there riding up. Your kid came home in the third grade just get covered in magic. Mama, look what I did. It's permanent, too. It's permanent marker. You say, that's, that's great, son. I'm glad you like that from now on. You just permanently marked up. That's beautiful. Beautiful artwork. How do you be 20, 30, 40 years old writing all over yourself and you think you're sane? Where did it come from? It came from worship of idols and demon gods and goddesses. And now they are property so they can inhabit you like a totem pole. See, a totem pole houses demons. So they made you into a living, walking totem pole. And you follow the fashions of this world. You're the friends of the world. According to James 4, 4, you're the enemy of God. I say it. Everybody bound by that demon, they don't get mad. The demon in them gets mad. You come against hip-hop, it ain't the person getting mad. It's the demon in the person getting mad. That's why I don't care. I don't care what demons think about what I say. You waste your time talking to me about a devil talking to me through you, bro. You wasting energy and you wasting your breath. Because this is right. And you're bound by a spirit from this present evil world. Anything that tries to replicate and duplicate the world cannot be from God. He don't import that trash. Why do you have to have this need in you to be like everybody else? Why don't you become unique? Why don't you become different? Why don't you become you? Why don't you get your own fashion and your own style? Why don't you dress uniquely like you want to? Everybody got on yoga pants. Dog, can we find somebody without some yoga pants on up in Walmart somewhere? <laughs> what is wrong with y'all? Do you have a dress? Do you have a sundress? Do you have a nice straw hat with that, with that straw hat tipped to the side, a nice sundress on, some sandals, springtime, little ribbon in your hair? No, they ain't what Nicki Minaj wearing. Nicki Minaj don't wear that. Cardi B don't wear that. Megan Thee Stallion don't wear that. So I ain't wearing that neither. Crazy. They dictate to everybody everything. It's the spirit of the age. It's the spirit of this world. They call it the zeitgeist out there. The spirit of the age. It dictates everything to everybody. Citizens of the matrix bathe in it. Whatever the world tells you is appropriate, you embrace it. Folk tell me, oh, you dress like you dress and get your hair cut like that because you're an older man. No, it's a normal man, right. knucklehead. <laughs> Ain't no older. It's just normal. You've been warped in your mind. Look in the mirror at yourself for real one day. Just look. You think that's normal? Think about what I'm saying. Looking like a porcupine. You think that's normal? a blowfish, and you think it's normal. What's wrong with you? The devil will drive you crazy 
and then you embrace insanity because so many people are insane. So in the asylum, everybody's the same. So I don't see any distinction made because all of us are crazy and the asylum is normal. And then they see me making fun at people, picking at people. See, you talk about people. No, I'm talking about you because you're the one that's crazy like the rest of them. You take it personally because you're one of them. There's a normal out here. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's a normal out here. The devil always changes junk because he wants to do what? Puppeteer you. He just want to change things to make sure you jump through the, to the hoops. We're going to do this. No, that's, that's out of style now. Don't nobody wear that no more. They'll tell you that kind of stuff. Oh, they stopped wearing that. Well, they who? Who? You see how stupid that is? Don't nobody wear that no more. Oh, we don't, you, don't go, you don't say that no more. You know, who? The devil folk got you crazy. You follow everything they put out there. You dress like them, walk like them, talk like them, sit like them, eat what they eat, go where they go, and say the same things they say, and you're crazy and don't know it. Because the devil's insane. This is a fool that had it made in the shade right around God's throne, given more brilliance and more authority than any creature, and he forsook it and failed. He's insane. You're following an insane creep. Crazy. This is an asylum. The Matrix is an asylum. It's all on TV. All the commentators, all the newsmen, all the people in the media, all the singers, all the people you see they, that they promote, they're crazy. They're insane. And you care. You actually monitor it. You keep up with it. You're crazy. You got to get your sanity back. You're driven into madness following the world and the spirit of the world. The spirit of the world is actually that, a ruling entity that rules the world. The spirit of this age, it will drive you crazy. But you got to go and escape it through rites of passage. You're moving through a process. You're leaving things behind. Every step in a rite of passage will separate you from somebody. If you're wounded and rejected, you don't want to leave them. I don't want to go to school. And I don't fit in. Fit into what? The insane asylum? Well, the girl likes somebody to look like this. So I got my pan pulled down to my butthole. And I got my drawers hanging out. And I got myself some tattoos. And I got nap knots everywhere on my head. And two earrings on. And I got myself a tattoo of LeBron James on my arm. And the girl said, man, you fine. You look good. Now you look like an organ grinder's monkey to look good to this boob girl. What are you, some kind of a nimwit or something? What's wrong with you? You know what's wrong with a lot of these guys? They ain't got a daddy. My daddy would tell me, boy, get that mess off your head and take your behind there and get a haircut before I slap you down the street and back up it again. Yes, sir. Well, I just thought, I, ain't, I don't ask you what you thought, boy. Get in there and get your hair cut and shut up. Barbara's name, Floyd. Floyd, I think it's really, it ain't really what's Floyd, Floyd the barber. Out there in, in uh, off of, what was it, we was out in Decatur, out there in Kirkwood. Every, every, two, every two Saturday, we'd be out there in that barber chair. And back then, they'd get you a low crew cut. They'd be like, you know, high, a little bit on the top and everything else just scalped off the side. And you better be happy and like it. <laughs> Talking about, well, at the rest of them in school, uh, they don't uh, wear it, pow, 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 uh, uh. I was just thinking, I'm, well, I'm going to make you stop thinking. <laughs> You're thinking too much. You see, when you start thinking, your mouth starts running. So to stop you from thinking, I'm going to stop you from talking. <laughs> but now, you crazy and your kid crazy, so your kid look like crazy you. Have you seen how many folk walk around with their kid looking crazy and the mom and the daddy look crazy too? The kid is a reflection of their mom and daddy being in the world. Little boys walking around with earrings in their ear, five, six years old, and all these old dreadlocks. Man, that's a boy. 
Give that boy a haircut. What's wrong with you? It's a shame, the Bible says, for a man to have long hair. Read it for yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's what God says about it. But to have a rite of passage, you need some type of dignitary that presides over it. It's witch doctors and tribal leaders over in Africa. So you need elders, you need bishops, you need people in authority to take you through rites of passage in the church. But right now, what do you have? Blind leaders of the blind. Everybody headed for a ditch. They can't take you through a rite of passage. Why? Because they never been through a rite of passage. They are boys in a pulpit trying to preach the gospel that is designed for a man and a woman while he's just still a boy. So they get up there and act like complete fools, toning up and toning up and yelling at you and talking all that crazy talk. Or you go to the extreme versions of academic acumen where they just tell you this dignified, dried up trash that don't move nobody. Open your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 2. We're going to take a look at verse 3 here. Let's examine that in light of the Old Testament compared to Philippians chapter 1 verse 7. Now, let's explicitly look at what happened here. First of all, we'll take a look at step one here. Anybody want to hear that? Man, this is dried up trash. Man, tell me something that's going to impact me, change me, and move me, man. See, that's that still that old dried up mess that has not got the anointing of the Holy Ghost because the person hadn't gone through those rites of passages to change them into a vessel fit for the master to use. You want God to use you. You got to be like him. You got to bear his image. What happens? What has undermined our development is the fact that we don't recognize we live in tribes. A tribe is right. Did you know that? We're supposed to be ordered in tribes. Without a tribe, you really don't have the basis for actually interacting with God. Look at Genesis 35. Genesis chapter 35. We need some tribes down here, man. We need a tribe for us to actually move through developmental stages to be made into God's image. We got to re return to the tribes. If you get a chance, go to our website, omegaministry.org. Go to media and then click on sermons and Bible studies. You'll find a message entitled the law of tribes, the law of tribes. I first taught this in the mountains years ago at a man up meeting in the mountains it was a mountain man up meeting. We taught about the law of tribes and how guys must go through rites of passage to become a man. Without those rites of passage, you'll remain an eternal boy. You'll get married as a boy. You become a father as a boy and you'll die as a boy. You could be a 70 year old boy because you never were released into your manhood. You need a rite of passage. You need to leave behind the trash. These young boys, that's why I talk to them like I do. Go get a haircut, man. Grow up. You get too old to look like that. You like a little running no third grader and here you are 16, 17 years old. Man, you just have you to grow up, bruh. Well, the Holy Spirit guy, they walk around like that. I want to be different. You a kindergartner, man. You can't stand by yourself. Why you got to be with other people? Get some guts, man. Get some gusto in you and stop trying to fit in. Guess what will happen to you? You'll be the only guy respected. That's what will happen. You want a girl really to like you that you're really interested in? Be different from the rest of them dudes and respect her and treat her like a lady. Why they yelling at her and treating her all kinds of ways? You cute her with dignity and respect. She gonna, you know, you, it's something about you. Well, I'm just me. I'm not trying to be like anybody else. That's what makes you distinct and different, that you're really you. See, folks that try to conform to the environment and the standards of the matrix, they can't be themselves. Be you. That way you don't have to change character. I'm me in the morning, me at noon, me when the sun goes down, and me when I wake up the next morning. I didn't change. You can't be married and stay faithful if you're just blown by the wind. Because Miss, Miss, Miss Thang going to come on your job trying to give you a few compliments and you, I'm glad you noticed that about me. You little sissy. 
because they're trying to sift you. They're everywhere. No? These women nowadays, they're not playing with nobody, young and old. They're not playing with you out there, man. They're for real because they don't have anybody. They were out there thinking they were doing something young, and now they done got old and still got nobody because they burned out. So now they're trying to fish and trying to salvage what they can. So any dude out there, you say hello to them, it's going to be on and popping. You better keep your mouth shut, boy, in a crowd. Don't be speaking to nobody. Now we're going in the store. Don't speak to nobody and look straight ahead. Don't look at no, just walk straight ahead. Don't look right or left now because you look at them, they're going to tear you down. They're going to come at you now. They're going to be like bees on honey. You better keep walking. Don't, look, don't, don't you look over there. Keep straight, look straight ahead. Now straight ahead. Have your, your mouth, your voice getting all high like soprano. Straight ahead. Straight ahead. <laughs> That's how you got to be. <laughs> it's dangerous out here in these streets. Why? Because they're thirsty. And thirsty folk need what? Water. 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 It's a desert, an arid place, a dry place. Seven women taking hold of one man to take away their reproach. That's on us right now, bro. So if you get some dignity and some self-respect and something about you that's got some kind of a value, man, he got 30 years old running 40, 50 women right now. Servicing them like a mechanic, like an oil changer. Just service them. Unless I eat my lunch over here, my dinner over here. I need two shirts. I get her to get those. And I need some matching pants. And I probably need some shoes to match it. I need all that because I'm going on a trip to the Caribbean with this other girl. So I'm going to get these other four to get my wardrobe together. So when I go down here on this cruise, I'll have my clothes together. Now we go to the island. I'm going to act like I'm going to the store because I got to meet this other island girl while I'm down there. So I'm going to slide over in Jamaica over to this island girl crib and get myself some Jamaican food and slide back to the hotel. And then I'll lay up with her and then we'll fly on back to the. Man, how you managing all that? Bro, that's, how, that's the life of a player, bro. You know, man, you burning yourself out. You're going to go crazy. But that's what they're doing. They're just stacking up women to the ceiling. And the women waiting their turn to be serviced like you're waiting in line for an oil change. You, not, you don't have a relationship. You, you got a Havoline oil change stand with a mechanic servicing you every once in a while. Calling them up, Ronnie, you're free. No, I got, another, I got another job before you. I could probably get by there on Tuesday. Okay. Just dumb as a box of rocks. Just stupid. <laughs> it's pitiful out there. That's why you got to get with God and let God direct your destiny. Because there no, there's no hope out there. It's hopeless. Don't look around. Just look up. Because there's nothing on the horizontal. You can forget it. If you think you're going to make up your mind about down here, you're going to go crazy. You better look to God and let God change you and let him give you what he wants you to have. That's the only way out of this trash. Other than that, you're going to go insane. I can promise you insanity awaits you. Look at this. Genesis 35, verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephraim. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, you shall have this son also. And it came to pass that her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. His father called him Benjamin. So Benoni means what? Child of sorrow. You're a child. Means the son of the right hand, the authoritative son. So you see, Rachel had Benjamin, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is in Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Now he is a boy who hadn't gone through a rite of passage because he didn't respect his daddy. You can always tell a child that has not gone through rights of passage that they won't respect their daddy. That son or that daughter will do dishonorable things toward their daddy because they have not gone through maturation level to show honor to whom honor is due. 
Same way in church. You can always tell a church person who hasn't gone through a rite of passage to know God because they'll dishonor the Father God and rebel against him because they don't respect him. Hey, man, don't save me none of that. Look at this. Reuben laid down with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. See, he bought Reuben. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn child. And he went and had sex with one of the concubines that Jacob had children by. You know, Jacob had four women he had kids by. I don't know what Jacob was doing, but that's a whole nother story. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. Now, Leah, you remember the story, right? Leah was the wife given to him instead of Rachel. Because Laban, her crazy daddy, tricked him and had him in seven years of servitude to get Rachel, but he tricked him and gave him Leah. And he was kind of disappointed that he got Leah, but he wasn't that disappointed because he had six sons by the girl. So something about Leah must have been all right with the boy. She had more sons than anybody. So Leah was doing something that Jacob appreciated. The sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padanaram. So you see now, Leah had six sons, Rachel had two, Bilhah had two, and then you had Zilpah that had two. That made up the 12 tribes of Israel. It, they're tribal, tribal. Judah was one of the tribes. Judah was one of the tribes. These are tribal inheritances here. What's a tribe? A tribe is a social division in a traditional, traditional society consisting of families or communities linked by social, economic, religious, or blood ties with a common culture and dialect typically having a, a recognized leader. What's a culture? The customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social groups. So you got an American culture that all ties us together because we got common arts, institutions, and achievements here. Dialect. What's a dialect? A particular form of a language which is particular or peculiar to a specific region or social group. That's a dialect. Now, a dialect is not the same as an accent. An accent is a particular mode of pronunciation of a language, especially one associated with a particular nation, locality, or social class. So you can have a southern dialect. You can have a midwestern dialect. You can have a New York dialect, that accent, you know, that accent there. I mean, accent. You can have an accent, this southern accent, this New York accent, this midwestern, because you can pick up that pronunciation of a word that's the same word, they just pronounce it different. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's the accent of that particular arena. So you see now a tribe has different character traits about it. You'll act like the tribe you belong to. Now Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So therefore our chief is Jesus in this tribe. He's the lion of the tribe of praise. When you come into Judah, you'll have a natural inclination to do what? Praise God because he is the praise leader in his tribe. It's going to be billowing in you even if you don't verbalize. It. It's something in you that praises God. You make melody in your heart to the Lord with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs because you're in a tribe that praises God. If you don't have that praise continually in your mouth, David says, your praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's because you ain't in the tribe. And the lion of the tribe is not governing your spirit, man. How do you get in the tribe? You go through rites of passage. Who's going to drug, judge the tribe? The chief of the tribe. How do you judge a, tri judge a tribe? You go through a tribunal. What's a tribunal? It's a court session. In the military, it's called a tribunal. In the civilian world, it's called a trial. But you're governed by the head of the tribe. You got to get your mind refabricated to understand you're in a tribe. 
So therefore, I adhere to what? The tribal dictates of the tribe. I don't break ranks in the tribe. I don't challenge the tribe. I don't go against the leader of the tribe and his designated authority. I respect the tribe. I respect the father of the chief of the tribe. And I accept the spirit that bathes the people in the tribe. But if you ain't in the tribe, don't none of that apply to you. You're a renegade outside of the tribe. A rebel is what you're called. Without submission to the tribal chief, there is no way to progress through rites of passage. You're a fatherless rebel like Reuben. See how Reuben broke ranks and laid down with his father's concubine? Because he was a rebel against the chief of the tribe. Jacob was the tribal chief. Where did he become chief from? He inherited it from who? Isaac. Where did Isaac get it from? From Abraham. See, it never ceases. You got to remain in tribal order to walk with God. These are the things not taught in church. So church folks stay ignorant of God's governmental authority. And so we sit here blind as a bat, going to church, listening to sermons, sermons going through all the gymnastics of religion, but we never understand what God is doing. God is now emphasizing maturity as he prepares us for an end time war. We're going back to tribal order. He is reinstituting this order in the church. People on earth are about to make the bad mistake of disrespecting the chief of the tribe and by proxy disrespecting his father that gave him preeminence over the tribe. That's the mistake they're about to make. They're going to blow it off and laugh at God like he's a clown at the wrong time. Right when they need God, they're going to blow God off as some kind of a clown and think he's a joke and they're going to die in their sins and they're going to find out that what he said was true as he sends them to hell. There's a real hell. He's really going to send them forever. I can't fathom sending somebody to hell forever. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like if you stole all your life, I figure, you know, okay, 300 years in hell. Let them out. I mean, come on. Come, they just stole. Let them out. Come on. It's fair. Okay, 100,000 years. Let him out. He's not going to. You got to get your mind out of human parameters. He's not going to. You're going to be in hell forever. And you can't get out. 100 trillion years. No relief. No release. Timeless existence where you just abide in hell. No hope. No way out. They think he's a joke. See, they're playing him as a joke, as a clown. Like he didn't say what he said and he's not going to do to me what he said. Because my daddy was a joke. I could smooth him up and I can get him to change his mind. My boyfriend, I could change his mind. I can always get my way and slick my way out of stuff. And he's going to snare him. At the most inopportune time, they're going to go to hell forever and can't get out. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he shall repent. If he said it, he will do it. And he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. And he won't change. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. You're dealing with a being that's already in the future. The people in hell are already there to him. He knows every one of them. Even every hair of your head is numbered. See, this ain't about how you feel. I tell folk all the time, I do as I'm told. I don't govern myself by my feelings. I don't feel like doing this some days. I do as I am told. You got to walk in the discipline of obedience. It's the obedience of faith. You do as you're told. If you love him, obey his commandments. Stop trying to feel your way through this. You're going to end up in hell trying to feel your way because you're going to be deceived by your feelings. I don't care how a person feels about it. This is true. Walk in it. This is the way you walk in it. Well, you know, I... You know what you said? I don't care if it hurts your feelings. I don't care. Because it's getting you out of hell. We preaching folks out of hell at all costs, no matter what the cost. Folks ain't ready for the real church. They're not ready for Jesus Christ for real as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You read it in Revelation. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is who they refer to in Revelation. He's coming back this time not as a savior, but as a judge. And he's holding a tribunal. That's the judgment seat. 
you receive for everything done in your mortal body. That's why we showed you Jeremiah's algebraic analysis. You saw how the different slopes determine where you were. That's levels of judgment. If you had, if you got almost totally vertical, you're going to receive a great reward. But the more you slope away from that vertical slope, the less you, the more you get closer to that, to that X axis, the less you're going to receive from God when you get judged. There won't be equal judgments made for Christians. You're going to receive for the deeds done in your mortal body. The apostle says, I know there's a crown of righteousness later for me. I kept the faith. I finished the fight. Wherefore, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. I don't know about you. But, buddy, I was obedient to the heavenly vision. When he struck me down on the road to Damascus, I got up different, and I never looked back. Everything I was as a Pharisee, I counted as nothing but cow manure that I might attain and win Christ. But you see, in a great house, there are many vessels, some to honor, some to dishonor. There's wood, hay, and stubble. But then there's gold and silver and all these precious types of jewels. You see, there are different people in this. And if a man does what separate himself from these, then he'll be complete and fit and honorable fit for the master to use you as an individual. It's an individual affair. You see, there are two corporate heads that lead rebellion in the body of Christ, Judas and Barabbas. They're universal beings. Judas and Barabbas are forever. Judas slept with them, ate with them, talked to him every day, received power to cast out devils and heal the sick, slept around him around campfires at night, listened to him every day for three and a half years, and then turned him in and cursed him and received 30 pieces of silver to turn him in. Barabbas should have been killed instead of him. Barabbas led a political movement. He was a member of the the, the, the zealots who were going to take over Rome through military might and was accused of murder, trying to lead an uprising, an insurrection against Rome. But they let him go and kill Jesus instead. Political folk trying to do this to establish a government on earth in time and space, thinking Donald Trump is the man. That's Barabbas. They don't like church folk because they got a political solution for a spiritual thing. Judas is a rebel against him, will deny him and forsake him at the end. Those folks sit in church right now, Judas and Barabbas. You got to examine yourself to see who you are. You got to understand this about God. You're in the image of God. You got a soul. What's it saying in Hebrews? If any man draw back my what? My soul will have no pleasure in them. That lets you know God has a soul. God's got a mind. God's got feelings. God's got emotions. God's got everything in him that you've got in you. And if you draw back from the discipline and the changing and the transformation process, my soul, God says, my soul will have no pleasure in you. You can get on God's bad side, buddy. You know what God hates? If he takes the time to tell you the truth and he, you spin in his face. Esau, I hate it. He hated the nature of Esau. This ain't nothing to play with. I don't tell jokes up here and kid around because your soul is waving the balance every time you open that Bible. Every time you read one verse, your soul is being weighed in the balance. Will you obey it and believe it? Is it serious to you? Do you take him at his word and do you tremble at his word when he speaks to you? This thing ain't for tenderoni. We need emotional folks, man. You got to make choices, decisive choices. If this man got a wife and kids, he got to decide to be a man. He got to decide to stand for his wife. He got to decide to protect his kids. He got to stand for them against every adversary. If he's a man, that's what God expects from him and nothing less. It's the way it goes. Not some old girl on the corner trying to trick him and seduce him. You got to be conscious of God to walk in this. I'm conscious of what God thinks about me, not you. You do what you do is unto the Lord. Your mind is set above, not on the earth. You mind heavenly things. You got to conduct yourself accordingly. This is a military affair for militant Christians that have been called for such a time as this to come against God's adversary to get in this war and win it. 
too many tenderoni guys drawing back. And God says, my soul has no pleasure in you. He can't stand the weak guy. He can't stand the guy who won't believe. The first two people to go to hell are the fearful and the unbelieving. Check it out for yourself in Revelation. First two to go. Because he gave you his word. And God knows empowered in his word and embodied in his word is the ability to change anybody. He knows that. You can't fool him. You can't play with him. You can't pretend because he knows what's embodied in that word. He knows what will happen to you if you begin to fast and pray. He knows you will metamorphosize and change. He knows it. You can pay the price to get in this. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to hold an end of the age tribunal to judge every man according to his works. There's two judgment scenarios, the Bema seat and the white throne judgment. One for the saints and one for the damned souls. I'd hate to be standing in that group before an angry Jesus Christ, the wrath of a lamb that will not judge according to his feelings. The books will be opened. And every man will be judged according to what was written in those books. There's a record of your life. You can get out of it now through repentance and forsaking. You can get out of the thing and have everything wiped clean. The blood can wash you whiter than snow. But if you mentally are sin and compromise and kid and that like a hypocritical fool before God, trying to say a bunch of junk to impress other folks to make them think you're spiritual, you are a fool. Because he's going to read the inside of you. He's going to know you're a nut that's trying to pretend. And he's going to curse you and send you to hell. I don't want to be in that number. You got to be serious in this. The first thing he told you to be was sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, Walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We spend time, three hours on Sunday, to preach a message that lasts all week long. I don't do this just for show. We open up Dunamis Tabernacle. I won't talk this long. It'll be an hour lesson and we'll go home. Because the lesson will run all day. Yeah. We plan on opening up 24-7 so the lesson just rolls through different preachers and teachers all day long. Yeah. I do this, man, to supply some firepower for seven days to get back here again next week. That's why we do this. It's designed to chop it up so when you commute back and forth to work, you can click it on and have a little time filler in the car for 20 minutes going to work. We're trying to keep that word flowing, man, flowing all the time because you got to have it now. We're in hell down here. This is walking through hell. We're living in raw sewage. The devil's in like a flood. He's filthy and he's bringing this filth with him. You got to have something to restore you, to reinvent you, to motivate you. To give you some kind of a drive and zeal and zesto in this. Because this is a depressing, foreboding place. This is a, this is a dark place, man. It's an evil place. You got to get a higher level of thinking appended to your mind to survive this. And you got to click and plug into God's mind in order to walk through this, man. I'm telling you. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Some demons don't get dispensed from your life but by prayer and fasting. You better go back to praying faster. You go to, better go back to not reading your word, but studying to show yourself approval. A workman need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't read it. Study it. Meditate on it. Get those scriptures and write them out. Meditate on this thing. Go to your concordance. Go to your thesaurus. Go to your dictionary. Go to your uh, study tools. Go to your commentaries. Man, we're living in a generation when everything is online. On your phone. You can look up every word in the Bible on your phone. God has made it user-friendly. This stuff is not for these folk out there. Everything you see is for God to make things user-friendly, trying to get us home. Amen. Every creation, everything you see is to get us home. All this media stuff, all these phones, that ain't for them. It's for the church to get home. I'm trying to extend my hand. He said, all day long, I extended my hand to a stiff neck, gainsaying, complaining people, and they would not take hold of my hand. That's pitiful. You can't blame God if you don't make it. He's gone out of his way to do this. He holds a guy like me back because I'm not here to save a world only. I'm here to judge a world and damn it equally. 
He can't afford to have me on a platform that's visible because I'm not going to play with nobody. I'm not here to go through all the gymnastics trying to understand you and go back and forth and psychoanalyze you. This is the way you better walk in it. See, all that garbage is wasting time. I ain't T.D. Jason, Joel Osteen. Your best life ain't now and every day ain't Friday. We're here to get a job done to extricate a, a church that's been bound in a world that hates God. I'm here to cut the ties, load them in an ark, and get out of here. So therefore, he just, no, boy, I can't. Because you, you, you kind of out there, and I know, by, but I'm not, he's not against me. He just won't let me. But he better know. If he give me the green light now, you know if you, if you see us go, you better get for real. Because that means you're going to lose people like that all over the world simultaneously. What are they? They're not the ruffian carpenters. It finishes. You got to have a particular person to close the age. John the Baptist was a finisher. John the Baptist didn't talk like the rest of them. He was a finisher. That's where we're at now, buddy. We're not in Genesis. We're in Revelation. We're at the close of the age, and the lion of the tribe of Judah is getting ready to roar. If you would, stand to your feet, please. Lord God, these are the times to try men's souls. We got a church world that thinks it's a joke. They want to hang around and blow bubbles and tell jokes all day. But God, you've been serious from day one. From the day you created Adam and Eve, you were dead serious. You knew they were going to fall. You knew what the devil was going to do. You made all kinds of accommodations to remedy everything he did beforehand. Because the Bible said Jesus Christ was crucified from the foundation of the world. You had the devil beat from day one. He thought he was playing checkers with a chess, with a chess master. him knew what he was going to do even when he willfully chose to rebel against you in heaven you knew he was going to rebel had him already paid the creation of God the creator of all things and the creature is trying to contend against him what a bad mistake so God we need some folk down here that tremble at your word that take you seriously that are saying you know what for God I live for God I die I'm through with this place I don't want anything from it I don't have anything to do with it. I'm here to do the will of God. Jesus, you said when you were here, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. That's all that's left to do. There's not much left here. A COVID-infested world, young kids growing up, there's not much future here for these young kids. A father and a mother look at their kid and wonder, what did the future hold for my kid, Really? What kind of world will they live in tomorrow? They're talking about nuclear war with Russia right now, moving troops. People don't study the troop movements and see what's going on in the Middle East and around the world. This thing's happening, shaking loose down here. You get to a presidency where nobody even knows what's going on up there. Just, just off the cuff, throwing away money and acting like they don't even know what time zone they live in. It's just devil may care just total confusion and just chaos everywhere. But the one sure thing that holds in the storm is you, the Lord Jesus Christ, an anchor that holds in a storm. So right now, God, we just turn everything over to you. And we know that you care for us. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us. You initiated this salvation plan, not us. And I thank God that you came through to come get us when we were just lost and swept away in trespassing and sin, doing every stupid thing we were big enough to do, but you saw fit to have mercy and grace on our lives. So right now, God, we intend to walk this thing out to the end, to see it to its final conclusion. Give us the empowerment. Give us the Holy Ghost power to live this thing through. Send your word. And raise up an armada of people that are going to stand like never before. Send healing for those that are sick. Deliver us from evil and the cosmocrator that controls evil, Satan. 
He's always walking around trying to undermine, destroy, trying to make people unclean, defile people, castigate, accuse people. It's time to cast down the accuser of the brethren. It's time for some church folk that are no longer bound to religion and their family members and friends. But say, you know what? For God I live, for God I lay down and die. I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of trying to conform. I'm sick of trying to perform up to somebody else's standards. It's time to live. We're commanded to live in Jesus' name. God, do it for your glory and for your honor. This thing is real. It's getting more real every day. As we see people lose their minds, we're seeing family members, friends, and children lose their minds. Follow behind the devil who is insane. God, raise up some folks. Bring these 7,000 that have not bowed their knees to Baal together. And let's get on with this. My prayer is to do it, God. Do it. Like the days of Elijah, do it again. Elijah came, John the Baptist came, now it's our turn. The forerunners for the latter rain. When Elijah prayed, after that fire fell and they killed the false prophets, he heard the sound of an abundance of rain. John the Baptist came. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The rain came in the form of a baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Jordan River coming on you. And now at the end of the age, to receive you back to earth, there must be a latter rain. The former rain came moderately. Now it's time for the deluge of the latter rain. You said the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former house. The former house was in the book of Acts, and we are the latter house. Glorify this thing. Glorify the church. Illuminate the church. Amalgamate the church. Anoint and appoint the church to stand like never before. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let the river flow. Don't let it be dammed up anymore. Open the floodgates of heaven and let it rain. Let it rain. Open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we're not even able to receive. Let the thing rain. Jesus' name. Look at these people dying in sin. Let it rain. Come on, God. Let it rain. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Come on. Around the world, let it rain. Bring the resources. Bring the people. We're looking for a million people worldwide. A million people. You, can, you got a million people worldwide. Bring them on board and let's just go. We'll do this. I'm not going back. I'm not looking back. I'm not looking to be a part of anything. I'm not looking to join anything. Let's just get it done. Let's get it done. That the Father be glorified in the Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we go, anybody here not saved, you know you're lost and you're going to hell if you died tonight. Anybody not saved, you come up here and we'll pray for you to be saved and receive the Lord as your Savior. We tell you up front what you're joining. We don't believe in a sinner's prayer saving you. You've got to make a decision to move over to where God is and stay there. A sinner's prayer won't save you. You got to make a, deci a decisive move to say, you know what? I'm leaving that life and I'm coming over to where the God is and I'll do whatever he says and I'll change and I'll obey him. Forget that sinner's prayer stuff. That, most of that stuff is just a waste of time and garbage. You got to know beforehand what you got into. He expects you to give him your, give him your body for him to live through you and your life to cease and desist. That's salvation. Anything short of that is a lie. And they've been telling lies one after another. These, are these evangelist, evangelistic outreaches and revivals with sinners' prayers. Now we have 40 converts and all of them going to hell and crazy just like the person that preached it to them. <laughs> Billy Graham didn't accomplish much. Much he gave them folk right back to Roman Catholicism after he prayed for them. Come on, man. Let's be real. Stop playing a sinner's prayer. I find that in the Bible. Time to be born again of incorruptible seed. Stop playing with God because God ain't a toy and Mattel didn't make him. This is real. Anybody knowing you, you are not saved and nobody knows you're unsaved like you. 
If you're damned right now, you know it already. And we give an opportunity about we have the internet. If you're not safe, stand up in your living room, your dining room, your bedroom, your den, and pray for God to save your souls. Tell him, hey, look, I hear this. I see me and what I am, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving my life to you, Lord. I mean, I'm sick of this. Whatever you got to do to me to change me, do it and fill me with the Holy Ghost so I can walk in your word and, your, and live your life and I allow you to live through me. It's that simple. Just make up your mind to say, you know what, I'm going due south. I'm turning around 180 degrees and going due north. Never to look back again. I don't want nothing. I'm leaving these folk behind. I'm leaving this alcohol, these drugs, these whores, this pornography behind, and I'm pressing on toward a new mark in Christ Jesus. That's real salvation. The term security is true, but you got to want to stay on track and stay in the program and the process. You can't go back like a dog to his vomit in a pit to wallowing in the mire. You got to stay focused on God and keep pressing forward to be saved. He that endures to the end shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. It's real. I offered you. That's the best I can do. By way of the internet, pray the prayer for yourself in your room alone and ask God to save your soul and get for real. That's all you can do. If he says his ears are open to the cry of the sinner. The only prayer you can pray as a sinner for God to save your soul. He don't hear nothing else because he don't hear the prayers of a sinner. Nothing but a cry for salvation. That's what he hears. That's what it's all about. The rest of the time you're kept by intercession of us, the saints. If you're not saved, the only thing that's keeping you alive is us praying for you because you can't pray for yourself. That's real. It's going to wrap it up for today. We're back here next week, 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember Bible study on Wednesday. Prayer tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Stay plugged in. That prayer number is 712-770-5603, uh, access code 409367. Remember to support Dunamis Tabernacle, www.omegaministry.org. Click on support, then donate. It's time to get for real. This ain't your grandmama's church, but it's like castor oil. It might not taste good, but it's good for what's alien. It'll run the devil out of you just like castor oil will. We'll see you back here next week. Be blessed. Have a good week.